Thank you. And it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you all to CC's poster session. And many of you may not know that April is Interprofessional Healthcare Month. And so we're absolutely delighted to be honoring it with such impressive student presentations that I know you are really going to enjoy. Um, today, you'll see a collection of work done by students throughout UNE's graduate and undergraduate programs some in collaboration with Rosalind Franklin University, and I believe we have a couple in collaboration with Tufts University. We're delighted to have so many undergraduate submissions this year, and we're looking forward to more in the future. Though it may seem to many of you that it's seamless to do collaborative learning activities and um, to successfully design and implement them, that is an illusion. <laughs> but um, this is a great time of year to thank a lot of people who have made this possible. So first, I want to recognize the generosity of all the faculty, staff, and advanced students who have really helped us this year, our graduate student leaders, and the professional staff. Um, and in particular, I want to thank, um, give a shout out to Dave De Diego and Lee Cody, who absolutely make this possible. To Megan Rogers and Elise Parker and Julie Shea, you have been amazing. To Kira Rodriguez, what would we do without you to uh, make sure we're doing stuff that makes sense and that makes a difference? to Sarah Garber from our good friend from Rosalind Franklin, Colin Bader, Tom Muser, and of course, the incomparable Michelle Cody and Chris Hall, um, without whom we would not be able to do this at all. Another individual for whom we will be forever grateful and who I will now introduce is Associate Provost Mike Shelton, who will have a few remarks. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Shelley, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to add my welcome to the Center of Excellence in Collaborative Education Spring Student Poster Session. Today's poster session is a shining exemplar of what the Center's purpose is all about. 108 undergraduate and graduate students representing 15 health professions, bringing their interprofessional learning and practice, practice experiences to life a time when we all come together to learn from, with, and about the amazing work UNE students are doing to improve healthcare practice and health outcomes. Today's program looks outstanding, so congratulations to all of you. UNE truly is a national leader in collaborative education. Some of you have heard me say this before, but it is worth restating. Barbara Brandt, the director of the National Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education, referred to your collective work at UNE as, quote, cutting edge leadership in the field of interprofessional practice and education at last year's Nexus Summit, where UNE once again had a strong presence with numerous student and faculty presentations. Faculty and administrators from other colleges and universities from across the country come to UNE to learn how we do what we do and often comment that they struggle to achieve the same outcomes we do because of entrenched disciplinary silos at their institutions. At UNE, collaboration is just a part of who we are and we're truly unique in that regard. In addition to the thanks that um, Dr. Cohen Conrad extended on all the folks who made today's uh, presentation possible, I'd like to thank her for her leadership of the center again, for who this event would not be possible for her not being in that role. So thanks, Dr. Cohen Conrad, for making this virtual event possible, along with the many other activities the center hosts and um, uh, conducts throughout the, the uh, academic year. And now it is my pleasure to turn the virtual floor back to you to present this year's Interprofessional Service Award. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike. That was very sweet and I really appreciate it. So, each year, I have the honor of presenting the Lisa Pagnuco Interprofessional Faculty Distinction Award. Dr. Pagnuco was a trailblazer in mentoring cross-professional student groups and was the first to bring the National Clarion Case Competition to UNE. Dr. Pagnuco is lo no longer at UNE, but her legacy definitely lives on through this award. And I'm probably going to get for Clint. I'm just telling you that ahead of time because I always do. <laughs> 
Um, this year, the award goes to trailblazers, trailblazers in the interprofessional research and scholarship arena. Dr. Elizabeth Crampsey from the Department of Occupational Therapy and Kira Rodriguez, IP evaluator extraordinaire, whose base camp is the Center for Excellence in Public Health, are receiving our award, award this year. Together and with interinstitutional colleagues and students, Liz and Kira carried out multiple research projects, each of which was presented at the 2021 Nexus Summit and one of which was recently submitted for publication, but we have not heard anything yet. So we're fingers crossed on that one. Their work as IP research scholars for Phil CC's promise not only to offer exceptional collaborative learning opportunities, but to evaluate their efficacy and meaningfulness to best practice. I can't thank you enough, the two of you. You are fantastic and your leadership in this critical arena was incredibly impressive. So please everybody join me in congratulating our 2022 IPE Faculty Distinction recipients. Look at that Zoom magic. Thank you so much for recognizing uh, the work that really is just an honor to be a part of watching the students, faculty and staff come together to gain such incredible skills. CECE does an amazing job and um, it, like I said, it's just truly an honor and a pleasure to work with the students in their process. Kira. Thank you guys. I love working with the CC team because you all love what you do and it's infectious and it ends up in quality work that is, you know, wonderful to to be around. So thank you so much for this honor. Well, congratulations. Again, one last hand of applause for our recipients this year. And uh, Chris, I pass it to you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Congratulations, Liz and Kira. You really exemplify what is true of everyone in attendance today. Interprofessional education is the work of many hands and many hearts. And we appreciate your time and energy. And now it's my turn to get teary, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> so my task today, I'm going to share my screen so that um, you can see the layout. My task is to um, sort of tour you around what's, uh, what's available to the folks on Zoom today. If you're viewing on Facebook or on the live stream, you can just relax and enjoy the show. It will come to you. If you're participating in Zoom, you can see that there are four breakout rooms. Um, relationships and telecollaboration take you through the interprofessional team immersion presentations, which are varied and fantastic. The research track uh, includes an extended discussion of the interprofessional mini grant funded work being done by students at the Westbrook Housing Authority with uh, Tom Muser. So that will be a great chance to discuss that thoroughly. And finally, in the students as teachers track, um, we're showcasing a variety of teams, including some really excellent leadership from both graduate and undergraduate students. And we're happy to be able to, uh, to showcase the breadth of what UNE has to offer that way. Uh, each presentation in the event today has an opportunity for Q&A built into it. So I hope you will take an active part and unmute your video and your audio when you're speaking and uh, engage in that conversation with us. Uh, Lee, you can go ahead and open up the breakout rooms now if you would. And everyone should receive an invitation to choose the breakout room that you're most interested in. Um, and go ahead and navigate there. And if you're, if you're stuck, um, stay in the main room and we will help you. If you're on Facebook and live stream in just a few moments, you'll start out in the relationships track. I'm so glad to see so many people joining us. The aim of the interprofessional team immersion was to provide University of New England students with the opportunity to gain a better understanding of the roles and responsibilities of each healthcare profession and have a chance to practice communication skills in a telehealth setting. 
The current group included students from occupational therapy, physical therapy, social work, osteopathic medicine, allopathic medicine, dental hygiene, and nursing programs. Our research questions were, how do interprofessional relationships affect teamwork and resilience? And does additional time for social connections have implications on teamwork in the healthcare field? Group faced um, many limitations while working together, one of which was difficulty built in trust and rapport with our client through telehealth as it lacks personality. Another one was the lack of time we had for building interprofessional relationships within our team. And we also had decreased exposure to other student health program demands throughout our curriculums. Um, some of the strengths that our group found were that we took additional time to meet as a group outside of what IPTI had provided us with. We had mutual respect and understanding of each other's professional roles. And we all came prepared with our own ideas and plans before our meeting to be able to contri contribute to the group. It's a unique experience within IPTI to receive feedback from the patient actors at the end of both patient encounters. Our team uh, experienced some significant challenges with the way we receive feedback from our patient actors. And this is why we've led to the research question of how to interprof interprofessional relationships affect teamwork. The additional time that we spent really helped buffer our resilience in the way we receive feedback to make sure that we could interpret that in a way that was productive for each other and ourselves as a team and our own future implications as healthcare workers. We apply this to our future practice. Together, we learned that spending more time communicating and elaborating with our team unit allowed us to gain a more clear understanding of the inter interventions each profession can provide. Working together to collaborate as a team unit on patient care plans allowed us to help gain an understanding as each other as a resource, as well as a referral network. We want to thank the University of New England and Rosalind Franklin University for coming together to make this immersion possible. Through IPD, students are able to make professional contacts outside of their own uh, health profession. They're able to gain comfort in identifying, acknowledging, and taking steps to prevent and correct medical error. And we're all able to practice our interprofessional interpersonal and interprofessional communication skills for diverse and difficult healthcare conversations. Really what this allows us to do too is take all of our awareness um, for how interprofessional teams come together and practice it on a clinical practice level. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. So this is a, we have a few minutes for Q and A and um, I, I expected Provost Shelton to raise his hand. Go ahead. I always, I always ask a question. So this is the entire group. Tell me one thing that you were surprised about, about learning something you learned about what another profession does. I was kind of surprised at how many um, resources like Sarah knew about. Um, she's in social work. And like, I didn't realize how, um, like, I honestly had not much of an understanding of what a social worker does. And after like doing this group experience, there's so much like that's like turning through my head and I'm like, okay, if a patient's struggling with this, I can get them in contact with a social worker and she can help them with X, Y, and Z. And like, there was like, that was a huge bridge that I feel like is going to help me in the future. Amanda, what profession are you? I'm in dental hygiene. Well, fantastic. Great learning. And Sarah, how do you, how do you feel about yeah. Amanda's learning? I'm so glad Amanda jumped right off first because I actually, I was going to say that I was so impressed that Amanda in, in dental knew so much about the patient's medications. She had done advanced research to really understand the pharmacological product. And I really would have thought that would have come from pharmacy. We didn't have a pharmacy student um, on our team. And that was really filled by dental. It, it really blew my mind how much awareness she was able to have. Fantastic. Another question. Courtney, did you want to say something? Sure. Um, I'm from physical therapy. Um, and I thought it was just unique going through the whole process, just learning about how kind of all of our professions interlap with one another, where someone might provide medication and someone might recommend exercise and someone might recommend um, just social work. So it kind of like was really neat to fill in the gaps for everyone else of where their profession kind of ended and where one started. So that was really unique that we could all kind of work together. Courtney, I should have shared um, the majority of my career here has been in the Department of PT. I was a program director for over 20 years. 
Thanks. Great. Who would like to ask another question or make a comment? I have a comment. I was looking at the takeaways and I really liked how it said to be intentional with your suggestions because I feel like through school you just learn so much and then when you're new in the practice you just want to help, help, help. And I feel like a lot of times um, it might be overwhelming for the patient to like give so many different suggestions even though you have good intentions. So I feel like I really enjoyed that takeaway of just kind of really thinking about like how much information you want to give and how, like how helpful it would be to kind of make that more concise and like more client centered. I wanted to um, comment about team resilience. I think that that is a critical takeaway and I'm so glad you presented on that because sometimes working with patients is difficult. <laughs> and, and especially when dealing with something like long COVID, which we don't really know very much about, I think patients are frustrated and uh, practitioners are frustrated. How did you come up with the idea to focus on re team resilience, which I think is very um, forward thinking? I can hop in and say that I think we wanted to develop relationships with each other and telehealth has been really challenging with that. I think that some of us discussed that our expectations would we would have time to get to know each other going into this experience. And one of the things we were hopeful for about the IPD experience was that we would have more informal time. And when that wasn't really presented, we created it. We joined with we joined a Zoom ahead of time for an hour and called it pre IPD mingle team mingle so we could just get together and chat about what was going on with our lives and our programs and our learning. We discussed a little bit of the case, but I think those relationships, um, what we learned was they were really significant, um, especially we got some difficult feedback from our actors uh, and in a way that really didn't sit well. And because we had invested in building relationships and trust with each other in that informal get to know you time, we were able to reconnect and kind of process that together and, and do a team processing. And I think that would really help us face adversity, just having relationships with our colleagues interprofessionally. Thank you for that, Sarah. That was great because relationships really matter. And the idea of psychological safety and feeling comfortable with one another is critically important in the workspace. And we heard that a lot in our research that we did is, is that ability to form relationships and trust one another was critically important. Um, I'll ask one more question if I, my, probably Mike and I can continue asking a lot of questions, but you've mentioned the difficulties of telehealth. And I'm curious if anybody would like to comment on that, that they're, the impression I got is that it's a little awkward, it's a little impersonal, um, but you can say more and how did you navigate that? I can jump in on that question. Um, I think one of our conclusions at the end of this project was um, that next time we would send in an initial patient navigator, um, likely the either the social worker, which would be Sarah or me as the occupational therapist, just to kind of build that rapport and trust with the client, um, because it is a little bit more difficult to do over telehealth. So that's one of our biggest takeaways for the future. Great. Thank you. Other comments? Just to just clarify, don't... Megan, are, are you suggesting like a hybrid model where there'd be some initial contact, but there could be follow-up sort of be, via the telehealth uh, option? Yeah, that and also just always having that navigator in the room, either over Zoom or I guess it could be with the, the client as well when they're interacting with other healthcare professionals. So they already have that trust relationship with one person. Yeah, to, to build off what Megan said, our patient expressed that she was overwhelmed when we um, had new health professionals enter the room. She didn't see a familiar face from the first session and she did express to us that she was like overwhelmed. She was like, who are all these new people? So that's why we thought it would be helpful to keep one person there constantly with other people rotating in and out. Thank you so much to this group. And I just wanted to keep everyone on track in terms of timing. So I'm just going to be sharing the next screen.
Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everyone to our poster presentation today. I know the team is really excited to kind of dive into our experience and share a little bit about it with you. Um, so our team consisted of a wide variety of professions. Um, so I'm just going to introduce ourselves real quick. Uh, so Cassandra Pierce of the School of Social Work, myself, Morgan Voigt uh, of Nutrition, Madison Champagne, who's a physician assistant student, Alexandra Fiera, physical therapy, and Tess Cyber allopathic medicine. Um, and she attends Rosalind Franklin. Um, so, all right, yeah, our topic, we talked about uh, how word choice affects the relationship building process with patients and clients. So really talked about how to build that rapport and the importance of word choice in that process. Um, so some of our key takeaways, um, we focused heavily on motivational interviewing. We found that this was a huge, huge part of our experience with Amanda. Um, so the fact that motivational interviewing is a great tool, especially when the patient is apprehensive about sharing information. Amanda was very hesitant coming in about having a new care team. Uh, she had been through a lot and having a whole new care team was really, really scary for her. So using those motivational interviewing techniques were huge. Um, further, our tone, body language um, was also really important and something that we realized we really had to be mindful of during the appointment with her to make sure that we were presenting ourselves as open and ready to have that conversation. Um, in addition, the importance of avoiding activating words. Um, so really activating word for Amanda during our appointment was choice. Um, so that's kind of, we can dive into that later, but what inspired this poster? Um, the art of mirroring your patient. Um, Cassandra, who's our social work student, did a wonderful job at this, really mirroring how our patient was feeling um, and making her feel comfortable in the setting. And also allowing time to pause and to reflect, especially during our simulation, things did get emotional, it did get heated. So again, putting that pause in there and really allowing time for people to reflect um, was super huge. So those are just some really, really fast key takeaways that we got from our experience. Uh, overall, it was an absolutely fantastic experience. I had a great time working with such a great group of people and a variety of professions. Everybody brought a wonderful perspective to the table. So overall, it was wonderful. Well, we, we have tons of questions here, at least in my brain, but I'm going to ask you first to see who has questions for this team. And I think language is so important, even, even more important in, in these current times. Um, but who else would like to ask a question? I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, Hi, my name is Kirsten. I'm in social work as well. And I'd love to know more about what you alluded to in your presentation about what was activating about the word choice. I'd love to hear sort of how that came about. I can answer that. Um, so during our interview, I asked what had led our patient to make the choice to go to the hospital. Um, and her... <laughs> Her return answer for that was that it was not her choice, that she has had no choice in any of the process that has happened since she had COVID, and that as a Black woman, she doesn't often have choice in the healthcare field. Um, and that particular conversation led to a very emotional state for her. Anyone else on the team want to reflect on the word of choice and how it activated? And Cassie, you just added an element that you were dealing with cross-racial um, patient-practitioner relationship and um, that the issue of choice does become a volatile issue often when we're dealing with race and, right, and discrimination. Um, but I'd be really interested to hear if anyone else on the team wants to comment on that before we move to another question. Um, I can. Another word that we um, used during our encounter was um, we said try. So the patient kind of felt that we were experimenting um, when we were like, oh, well, we could try this um, as a solution um, or we can try this medication that should help. And she's like, what do you mean try? Like, or, and, like why are we experimenting on me? And so that just was another um, example of how you being very particular about the words you use and how um, you speak to the patient and especially with the whole scenario, um, just making sure that you're taking each patient as 
an individual um, experience and making sure you're getting the whole picture and being very particular with your word choice. Um, that's something like that was our biggest takeaway from this experience. Thank you, Madison. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd like to add to that. <clears throat> um, so when when our patient uh, became activated when the word choice was used, um, Cassandra used a really cool tool to kind of de-escalate the situation. And it was as simple as just taking a moment to pause and just allow your brain to kind of reflect on what's going on and to breathe and calm yourself down. Um, and I, I was amazed by how well that worked. And I think all of our teammates were like shocked at, um, you know, the uh, effectiveness of it. So it sounds like you learned a lot from each other in a, a very difficult situation. Um, and, you know, it, it occurs to me that with another client, the term choice or the term try might not be activating. And so you, you do the best you can in the situation that you're in. And it sounds like that's exactly what this team did. Um, any other questions? Um, I'm just not going to uh, ask a question. It's just a comment, and it is uh, how uh, every day we learn from our patients. I think that our patients are our teachers and uh, that we learn from every patient experience. Thank you, Dr. Arafat, for that. Do you, do you feel that way? Do you? Does the team that did this, do you, is that something you got from this, is learning from your patients? Yeah, they're, they're, they're a member of the team as well. Thank you. And Julie, do we have time for another question or are we moving on? We are moving on. I was just going to say thank you so much for this group and I'm gonna, um, we have a transition for one minute. Hello, we are the Empathetic Earthlings and our poster is called Promoting Optimism and Interprofessional Approach to Treating Long COVID-19 Via Telehealth. Um, the purpose of our poster is to uh, showcase how we approached a case of chronic illness using a collaborative approach in order to positively address the needs of our patient. Our patient uh, was a 39-year-old female suffering from a case of long COVID and she had difficulty accessing resources to help her get treated. So our team took a collaborative approach to help her obtain the resources and help that she needed. The team wanted to know as much as possible about Amanda as a person. We wanted to know about her interests and her strengths, her family life, her job and financial situation, as well as what gave her life meaning. This discussion, the discussion of these topics helped not only the team, but Amanda realize how much she'd been missing in her life, um, in her journey with long COVID. And this prompted us to focus on ways to offer empathy to her and also suggestions for optimistic ways that she could manage her journey as she goes forward through this process. After investigating the extent of and context surrounding Amanda's health issues, the team suggested diet adjustments, new medications, and various maneuvers to help with pain management. While answering questions regarding the side effects of medication proved challenging in real time, the optimism generated by the easy to do maneuvers recommended by our physical therapist more than overcame the mishap. The immediate impact the maneuvers had on Amanda's pain dramatically shifted her disposition from a state of despair to one of hope. Table one contains considerations from each individual specialty. And as far as benefits of working on an interprofessional team, firstly, we each have expertise in different areas. So working together allowed us to expand our pool of knowledge. Second, collaboration as a team allowed us to give and receive feedback prior to presenting ideas to the patient. And third, because we were able to work together in real time, this promoted efficiency in communication and therefore patient care. 
So after receiving feedback from Amanda, there were a couple of things that we could have improved upon and um, we had a couple future considerations. So these included having everyone on screen introduce themselves before starting their patient interaction, summarizing our plan of care and being clear with what we wanted to accomplish in each session, and also giving Amanda tangible and specific advice for things that she can work on herself that would help her to empower her and reach her goals. In terms of takeaways, throughout this experience, our team agreed that we were grateful to have the opportunity to collaborate and better understand each other's scope of practice while finding common ground through supplying empathy and validation during our time with Amanda. We found that providing the right amount of support and empathetic validation in combination with simple and easy integrated interventions were most helpful to, to Amanda. Lastly, we want to thank everyone who made this opportunity possible. That was inspiring. <laughs> thank you so much for that presentation. Um, so I'm going to open the floor again to some questions or comments, and um, I love the, the focus on positivity and how you create positivity at times of deep uncertainty and um, just the context of the times. So who would like to uh, ask a question or make a comment? Kelly. So I, um, I'm curious about the things that you learn that you'll take out into the world with you. Um, what was most important about this experience that you think will really translate well um, into your practice and, you know, things that you will, you, you re will remember when you move on into your professional life? I can take that first. Um, Hands down, it, it actually the title of our poster encapsulates what I will take forward from this experience, and that's promoting optimism. Some of the feedback we received from our actresses, which both of them in real life, it turns out, suffer from chronic illnesses. So the, the feedback was truly meaningful. And um, the patient, Amanda, asked me at the end of one of the encounters or during some feedback um, why I asked so many sad questions, and I'm a social worker. so. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, kind of a, a gut-wrenching thing to hear, but it really, uh, definitely my takeaway from that is to, you know, she indicated that I had left her kind of thinking about some sad things in between encounters and kind of then kind of walked away. And so that was incredibly impactful for me. So I hope to never do that again <laughs> um, and always try to, um, you know, do something similar to what Emily Howe did. She kind of swept in and in PT and just gave Amanda this amazing, um, physical therapy, it was a very, seemed like a very simple thing that, that the patient could do on her own with limited instruction and left her feeling with a sense of, oh my gosh, you know, there is some hope. And so I think that's my, that's my takeaway. Other team member, oh, go ahead, Jen. Hi everybody, what a great presentation. It was really exciting to watch. Um, sort of building on Kelly's question and, um, I think my question is for you all, but mostly for you, uh, Hannah, as a rising physician. Um, very curious to hear how this experience impacted your, um, your thoughts and beliefs and future practices on leadership. Is that a clear, am I unclear? I'm curious how this may have impacted your ideas of, of uh, how a team works and how leadership is involved as a part of a role. It's a little out, of, not exactly a relationship, but more of a role question. Jen, can we open that up to the whole team? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So really the question is about how the experience impacted your sense or your empowered you to think about your own leadership and your role as a leader on the team. Well said. Thank you for um, that help there, Shelly. Hi, um, guys. So I oh. am um, the physical therapy student, but to kind of go off of that question, I think um, being able to advocate for your own profession, especially when working with others who might not have like a really good sense of what it is or what you do is a big part of that. Um, and being a leader within your own profession to be able to advocate and like say what you do and what you can offer is a really big part of that. And I, I definitely learned that in this, in this experience. 
Yeah, and to build off what Emily said, I, I'm a first year medical student at the Chicago Medical School, and I completely agree with what Emily said. I think as a future physician, I think it's really important to really create the space for these other professions to really talk about their experience and their expertise because they're so it's so valuable. And I'm so incredibly glad that I had this experience so early on in my training because I get to learn about these other professions and what they can offer. And it's ultimately, you know, the amazing work laid by Kirsten, our social worker, creating that foundation of trust and, you know, simple movements um, with Emily Howe and, and our PT student and our OT student that really led to that sense of self-efficacy for our patient. And that's ultimately what we all hope to do, like leave our patients with a sense that this can get better. And that's what I'm so grateful about this experience. Well, I think, unfortunately, we have to move on, right, Julie? We could talk about this for quite a while. Thank you all for this. And now we're going to the fourth presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my team and I are going to be presenting on an interprofessional care approach to long COVID treatment. To start, what is long COVID? Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, many patients have been struggling with ongoing physical and mental symptoms that persist long after their original diagnosis. So Kendra is going to talk to us a little bit about who Amanda, our patient, is and some of those symptoms that she's been struggling with for a while. Amanda is a 39-year-old woman who was hospitalized after being diagnosed with COVID-19. Amanda has been experiencing severe migraines, fatigue, and other symptoms relative to long COVID. In order to provide the best care for Amanda, we, as an interprofessional care team, asked her what her most relevant fears and concerns were at present time. Amanda stated, I want to feel more like myself. I want energy, to breathe like a normal person, to not be tired, and not have migraines. I want to feel like my old self. Amanda also felt depressed for her children and husband, Mo, because she wasn't being the mother or wife that she used to be. While treating patients in interdisciplinary teams requires an additional layer of coordination, there are many benefits from a provider point of view. Chief among them is real-time collaboration and communication, time efficiency, and reduction of miscommunication. There's also a greater sense of shared ownership and collective responsibility of the patient's well-being. One of the largest benefits of working in interdisciplinary teams is that we can take a divide and conquer approach and provide focused attention to specific issues that the patient is dealing with. For example, during our second patient encounter, while one member focused on medication changes, another member focused on virtual and in-person support groups, and yet another focused on counseling our patient regarding nutrition and dietary changes. In addition to the benefits provided to the team, there are also benefits from the patient perspective. Our guiding principle was to address the patient's physical, mental, and social needs. This provided clarity to our agenda for each meeting and in the creation of the treatment plan. The interdisciplinary approach also makes efficient use of the patient's time and energy. Amanda did not have to repeat her symptoms and concerns to each team member. Instead, she was able to communicate this information once. Lastly, Amanda arrived to us discouraged by her symptoms and lack of improvement. She met with a diverse team ready to work together to help her make progress. By the end of our last meeting, she felt supported and hopeful for positive change. The team provided Amanda with access to support groups in her area, as well as groups on social media that she could connect with to feel supported and believed. They also provided Amanda with a self-care worksheet to fill out with each of her children in order to discover quiet activities they could do together to connect and keep Amanda from experiencing migraines. The goal with this sheet was to involve her children in the process to keep Amanda physically and psychologically safe while interacting with them and for the family to assume agency over their daily lives at a time in which so much felt out of control. Additionally, the team provided financial resources because both Amoa and Amanda felt that they were in need of financial assistance given lost work as well as ex extremely high hospital bills. Even though there isn't a lot of information on COVID-19 or the long-term effects, we learned a lot as a group. We learned about each other's professions, how to work together, and how COVID will affect individuals in the long run. We also learned collaboration, communication, and problem solving, all while keeping the patient in mind. Having the opportunity to discuss patients as a team 
and get different perspectives from other professions allowed us to create the best treatment plan for the patient. We would like to thank our facilitators, Dana Laham and Albert Abina for their guidance and encouragement throughout this experience. Additionally, we would like to thank Chris Hall and the CC team for organizing this interprofessional learning opportunity. Thank you for listening and we are happy to answer any questions. Okay, it's time to be happy to answer any questions. Uh, who would like to start? Well, I'd like you to talk about shared ownership. You used that terminology, which I thought was really powerful um, because often individual professions feel responsible and that they carry the burden. That's the language we've heard quite a bit. Um, so can one of you or a number of you speak to that issue of shared ownership? I can, I can start us. Um, I think we had pretty frank conversations right at the beginning um, to sort of uh, state where we were each coming from. We all had pretty um, common concern for Amanda's mental health um, in addition to her physical well-being. And so there was this sort of immediate like, okay, we're all here for the same reasons. And then we were able to find sort of which professions complemented each other well. And I think that really helped in terms of um, sharing the burden and also being comfortable saying like, I've got these things, can you sort of take this? So from a social work perspective, I found myself sort of aligning with OT a lot. Um, and I know like our physician and PA bounced off each other a lot. So they're um, there were just ways to say, like, we have a lot of common ground here, so how can we do this without bumping up against each other or doing double work? Thank you. Other members of the team, would you like to build off of Katie's point? Just to build off of what Katie said, I think something that we did before we ended each meeting, we were clear about who was covering what. So expectations were clear leaving each meeting. Um, and then we knew exactly what we needed to work on before our next meeting. So I think that not only kept us on track, but it also really did feel like the burden of research and looking into different um, resources and such was really shared because we, we made a plan before each meeting ended, which I think is helpful. Nice. Really nice. Other. I think also to add to what Kelly just said um, and to really enhance what they said, um, for us, we all knew that time was of the essence and that for really for us process and agenda was really key. And so um, Mary was really great in helping us all focus on coming up with, you know, three different priorities, like no matter what, based on the patient's set priorities, we're going to address it from a physical, mental and social point of view. And we're definitely going to do that and have that be our goals by the end of the meeting. And so I think that really focused us and made us all invested in that process. It's something we agreed to, it works really well. And I'm, I'm thankful that we all you know, had that experience for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question or comment for this, for this team. From an OT's perspective, I kind of loved how you guys provided that self-care uh, worksheet for her and her kids so that she could still continue doing things that are really important to her but not kind of add on more stress to you know every all the other symptoms that she was going on yeah we had, I feel like we had a lot of ideas between all of us on what we could work on for this patient to in our view improve how she's doing but I think like kind of what Swathi was saying what really focused us was we we put it to the patient What's important to you? What are your priorities? What is your right now needs to get done? Um, and that's, I think, what partially led Katie to go down that road. Okay. I know we have to wrap up, but I do want to say how impressed I am with the fact that you did a very intentional planning. Like you, that was something that it sounds like you did with care and you did with foresight and even though working with patients is completely unpredictable at times. The fact that you did that uh, was very impressive. Um, so I don't know whether you wanna say something about that because I know Julie's gonna shuffle us off to the final presentation, but good work, really good work.
Welcome to our IPTI poster presentation. Our title of our slide is The Power of Interprofessional Collaboration in Building Rapport, Addressing Long-Term COVID Through Telehealth. Our professional team consisted of students in various healthcare fields, including allopathic medicine, osteopathic medicine, physical therapy, occupational therapy, social work, and pharmacy. This poster is to show us how we use telehealth and motivational interviewing to treat our patient with long-term COVID. With the prevalence of the COVID-19 pandemic and the movement of most of telehealth, we wanted to ensure a safe and comfortable environment for our simulated patient, Amanda, to discuss her experiences with her COVID. So the primary goal of motivational interviewing was to understand the most important, most impactful symptoms that our, uh, our client was experiencing. And from that, we figured out that uh, the migraines that she was experiencing and sensitivity to light and sound were having the most negative impact on her life overall. Our team also focused on building rapport with Amanda. It was clear from our first meetings with her that her symptoms were causing her distress. So we focused on validating her feelings and showing her empathy throughout. And this was especially important because all of our interactions were via telehealth. And through building the strong rapport, she was able to trust our recommendations like a medication change. She has high blood pressure, a cough and migraines. So we decided to switch her from lisinopril, which um, can cause a dry cough and change her to propanolol, which could treat all of her symptoms and not adding additional medications on top of everything. We really focused on simple solutions that Amanda could see fast results with. She was an employee at Home Depot and we came up with finding different light bulbs to limit the brightness in her house as well as using earplugs and kind of going forward we think future considerations especially for rural medicine can keep that in mind so finding non-pharmacologic homeopathic simple solutions um, to treating patients with long COVID symptoms. I just have to say how struck I am with how different each of these presentations are and and what the different focus there is on on each one so um questions or comments for this this wonderful team I know someone has questions besides me <laughs> so I'll jump in with a question for you Shelly uh so I put it in the this. chat as well but I'm just curious um you know, in those moments where some uh, role blend happens, how your team specifically might have navigated um, that reality. I can kind of talk a little bit. Um, we didn't do any kind of like pre meeting mingling or anything, but our team, I think it was just because we were all so patient focused that we all kind of just got along super well um, immediately, uh, which was really great for kind of taking that into building rapport with Amanda. Um, I think one of the big things that we did was um, we would just kind of be like, okay, um, I'll do this, you do that. And we just kind of gave each other responsibilities. And then in each um, interaction with Amanda, we also, I think the first um, team today spoke about this a little bit, but um, Amanda was overwhelmed, of course, in all of our interactions, especially with seeing somebody that she hadn't seen before on our team. But we um, started each interaction with saying, um, I know you spoke with Billy, who were, was our occupational therapist, or yeah, occupational therapist student um, last time, and just kind of started each interaction with a follow up from what our team members told us the time before, um, and that was huge in creating rapport um, with her and kind of showing her that we have good communication within the team. So um, we kind of saw her trust us better, and even though she didn't see me, which she saw the first time. Um, another team member kind of talked about what I had taken from our interaction. Nice. Yeah, and to echo what Molly was saying, I, I really didn't know what to expect going into this experience in terms of how our team would work together. And like Molly said, I felt like from the beginning, we were all extremely patient focused. And I feel like that helped us really um, center our strengths as a team. And it was always about what would be best for the patient. So if we knew, for example, Billy has a lot of experience with motivational interviewing, we would talk through what he would do. And then if someone else had more experience talking through medications, we kind of, we base our interactions that way so that we were really um, highlighting our strengths and meeting her needs. 
other questions or comments? I think for me, I loved the concept of giving short-term solutions to some of her issues. Um, that that felt like a way of really honoring her situation, that she was really in distress. Um, and But also, it, I think he was very clever to think about what can we do for her in the moment that would give her some relief, that would boost her optimism in, in a sense. Can you talk a little bit about how you came up with that as a team um, and uh, how you utilized it? Uh, yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, so through the motivational interviewing, we, we realized that um, the migraine symptoms were causing a lot of emotional distress, um, which was playing out in her family life in a really huge way. Um, so my thought process was kind of just to, we can get in the way of these physical symptoms uh, as efficiently and as quick as possible. We can start to counteract the emotional fatigue um, that she's experiencing, that the rest of her family is experiencing. And if that emotional fatigue can lessen um, and she can start to feel better emotionally and her family can start to feel more supportive, um, then you know maybe the, the, long, the longer term effects of uh, the different medication um, could have time to catch up and do that. And she can also use these, uh, these simple interventions at any time. Um, sunglasses inside might look a little weird, but it's very effective uh, at reducing brightness and, and reducing um, those migraine symptoms caused by light. Wearing headphones inside also might look a little weird, but you know she can do it at any time. It's a very simple thing um, that can cause, that can bring about some pretty instantaneous relief. Um, so yeah, it was just, you know, starting at the bottom and, and working our way up from there, I guess. Nice, thank you. Other members of the team, was there any resistance to that or did everybody, cause she said you didn't plan, but it just, you just had this nice synergy. Was there, um, any other thoughts, Devin? Yeah, I would say that there definitely wasn't wasn't resistance. I think we were all very thankful that that Billy kind of had those ideas and offered them in the moment. Um, because as we said, our our um, standardized patient was pretty distressed throughout our interactions because of her physical symptoms, and it was also really powerful because Billy, like you said, used kind of the information he'd gathered about how it was impacting her life, but also the fact that her and her husband in our case worked at Home Depot. And so the suggestions that he was making about potentially buying different light bulbs or different things like that, um, that they could actually get where they work um, was even more actionable for them. And they both felt way more empowered after those suggestions. Well, really nice work, everybody. I, I know I'm supposed to remind you to do the attendance sheet. Um, and more than anything, though, I want to thank you for your fantastic work. And there's no coming together afterwards. So once you do your attendance sheet, you may do whatever else is part of your day. And thank you so, so much for your participation. Yes, okay, awesome. All right, so welcome everybody. I'm Michelle Cody and I have with me today, Sarah Garber from Rosalind Franklin University. This is the telecollaboration track, so welcome. And right now we have a quote from our alumni to reflect on. Our first presentation today in this time slot is utilizing a healthcare team to foster trust through telehealth visits. And this is IPTI team three, the qualified caregivers. Utilizing a healthcare team to foster trust through telehealth visits. So in this simulated experience, we used an interdisciplinary healthcare team to provide simulated care for Amanda, a 39-year-old female living in rural Maine suffering from symptoms of long-haul COVID. We researched health disparities that Amanda and others may face living in a rural area. These health disparities may result from lack of health access to healthy food, fewer health care workers, less emergency rooms, and limited transportation options. The interprofessional health emerges and provides a platform for people in different professionals to, in to interact and gain experience from each other. Um, the IPTI program was presented by dental hygiene, nursing, PT, OT, PA, social work, and medical students. 
Um, the goal was to develop skills for person-centered care through um, teamwork and communication. We did talk about telehealth. Telehealth is the use of technology in order to access healthcare information and be able to make appointments and interact with healthcare professionals. The telehealth visits. Within the initial telehealth appointment, the goal of our healthcare team was to effectively establish a healthcare plan based on the patient's ability, values, and goals. There were several factors which made Amanda's case of long COVID unique and potentially challenging. These included living in a rural area, her reluctance to recruit the help of a healthcare team, and her fears that her symptoms might not be believed. For our initial appointment, the team utilized open-ended questioning and motivational interviewing principles to gain an understanding of Amanda's experience with long COVID up to this point. The motivational interviewing techniques utilized were open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, summarizations, and listen, listening for the client's values. Through this, we're able to build rapport and establish the patient care goals of wanting more energy, wants to feel good about herself, and wants to have more consistency in her health day to day. After the telehealth visits, we had a feedback session with our team, facilitators, Amanda and her husband. One aspect that Amanda noticed was that there was a shift in our team dynamic from the first to second simulation, from a more formalized history taking approach to a more cohesive one. Amanda also mentioned that she was grateful to have the familiar face in all the visits, which was a social worker on our team. Lastly, Amanda and her husband explained how the suggestion of the support Facebook group was beneficial because it gave them a way to find others that are going through similar situations with long haul COVID. Overall, participating in MD was a great learning experience. Some things we've learned as a group was how to implement motivational interviewing the importance of motivational interviewing and how to collaborate with other professions and team members. Some things that would have made the experience a little bit better uh, was spending more time outside of these sessions to collaborate and to create a more cohesive plan of care for Amanda that could have been delivered in the first session in order to relieve Amanda's anxiety. All right. So I will now hand the floor off to Sarah Garber. Any questions or comments on this fabulous presentation? If any of you are on this team, feel free to introduce yourselves or give a wave yeah. and share your experience. There you are. I can start off. Um, how, how did your team or in, you individually feel about the telehealth experience? How did that change what you did or how you thought about interacting with the patient. Hello, my name is Amelia. Um, I'm a second year uh, medical student at the College of Medicine. Um, and I can speak to that a little bit. So traditionally I've always thought of um, interprofessional work to occur in the hospital setting or in the outpatient setting. Um, but this really opened my eyes to the idea of interprofessional work occurring over telehealth. Um, as we know, so many errors uh, in medicine occur because of communication issues. Uh, so with telehealth becoming more popular, um, especially since the pandemic and us realizing how much that increases access uh, to care for people in rural, rural and underserved areas, um, that this approach to medicine uh, utilizing telehealth is perhaps like a really effective way to reduce these um, communication errors and um, make it so that patients can access all types of health um, more readily um, that's most convenient to them. That's excellent insight. And, and I think we are becoming, as a, as a community, we're really realizing the power of telehealth in, in addition to some of the limitations too. Um, there's a question in the chat and the question comes from Dr. Crampsey, our new award winner. Um, the question is, you mentioned the patient felt a shift in the second session as, as a, did you as a team feel that there was a shift? Was it intentional or did it just sort of happen? Did you have an aha moment about the take home mes message from this experience? Hi, um, I'm Hope Pryor and I'm a first year OT student at UNE. Um, I think one of the main differences from our first session to our second session was that we weren't familiar with each other as different professionals. And so sometimes we kind of approached it in a way that seemed to overwhelm Amanda. And since we weren't familiar with each other, we weren't sure how to address that. But by the second session, we had better rapport with each other. So when we 
since that Amanda was getting a little overwhelmed, we were all able to work to together to find a solution together. So I think overall, becoming more familiar with each other was super helpful in making Amanda feel more comfortable. Another really good insight. So is there sort of a, a take home message that you would suggest that next, next sessions IPTI teams pay attention to? Hi everyone, my name is Jason. I'm a second year DPT student. Um, and I think to answer that question, I think if we spend more time outside of like the IPTI sessions, getting to know each other, learning about each other's professions, and then coming with a more cohesive goal. Um, Cause I know in the first session, we didn't really leave her with a plan or like what our plan was with her. Um, but by the end of the second session, we had a more solid plan and then her anxiety was like uh, basically gone because she, um, like she was able to live her life the way that she wanted to with that plan. Excellent. Excellent. Sounds like everyone had a really good experience. Grew a lot. Michelle, how are we doing on timing? Well, I was just going to say we have a little bit less than a minute left. If anyone has any closing thoughts or comments on how you felt it was working with someone in a different uh, or many people in other programs or professions, uh, we just got a couple quick seconds if anyone wants to add that. I just, I just, um, this is Kim Fasula. I'm one of the faculty from Roslyn Franklin, and I was a faculty facilitator for this group. So I just wanted to tell you guys how proud I am to see this culminate into a poster. And um, just to once again, comment about the progress that I was able to see from your first session through the end and how you really became a cohesive group. So I just wanted to say good job. Interdisciplinary team telehealth visit may be even more challenging. Our team reviewed the experience of working with a simulated long haul COVID patient to create an easy template of do's and don'ts to promote a successful interprofessional telehealth visit. To introduce ourselves, the members of our interdisciplinary team include Hannah Freeman, student registered nurse, Sarah Haas, student of physical therapy, Keely Hart, student registered dental hygienist, uh, Meredith McHugh, osteopathic medical student, Tally Toomey, occupational therapy student, and we are all students at the University of New England. And lastly, we have George Deruge, medical student at the Chicago Medical School. We also wanted to acknowledge that this project was an interprofessional team immersion project. And we also wanted to acknowledge Dr. Rachel Mayer, who was advising us throughout this project, and to Amanda and Mo, who were the community actors who facilitated our learning experience and gave us valuable feedback, and to all of the staff at the Center of Excellence and Collaboration Education at the University of New England, as well as the faculty at Rosalind Franklin University for making this experience possible. We all work together as an interprofessional team for this case study pertaining to long COVID through telehealth. Through this process, we reflected on our teamwork and how we could improve to make a better experience for the patient. We met in total four times over telehealth. We received feedback based on these sessions in order to develop an easy list of do's and don'ts as a template for future teams to have a more efficient and productive experience. Our guide is as follows. Use a questionnaire before meeting the patient to gather information. Do ensure privacy. Do know your team and introduce them. You should actively listen. Do make actionable goals that are patient-centered and also do be flexible. Don't make assumptions. Don't forget bedside manners. Don't forget you are on a team. Don't ask close-ended questions. Don't forget the use of the, don't forget to use the family and don't be afraid to redirect. Through the entire immersion experience, we were able to connect our project to and work towards the core competencies of CC, which are roles and responsibilities, communication and teamwork. We look forward to answering your questions in further detail and cannot wait to chat with all of you. All right, great job, everybody. Like I said before, I'm Michelle Cody and I have with me Sarah Garber from uh, Rosalind Franklin University. So Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Michelle. Excellent presentation and I love the telehealth list. I think maybe we could use this in future versions to and include it in our orientation for IPTI. 
possibly in the next version. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Yes, Dr. Sheldon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the presentation. So th this is to everyone um, who, who presented. What, what do you see as the future in your respective professions on the utility of, of telehealth? You know, we've been hearing over the past two years, lessons learned from our rarest experiences with the pandemic. Um, you know, much of care was possible because, you know, accelerated use of telehealth, which really wasn't, hadn't gained a lot of traction across the country, so, you know, so to speak in some pockets, but, you know, certainly got accelerated during that time frame. Do you re-envision your practice experience um, you know, sort of based on, on what you learned, you know, through this past semester? I think it does depend which particular specialty that you're in, but obviously for the um, physician's role, this is not going away anytime soon. We've seen telehealth only expand throughout the pandemic, especially, but also you've seen people move to areas of the country where they don't have access to the same amounts of care that you can get in cities and areas where they used to be living before um, remote work gave them the opportunity to move. Even outside of um, just medical care from a physician standpoint, two of my colleagues, um, Sarah and Tali, work in physical therapy and occupational res therapy respectively. And I was really impressed with the way that they were able to incorporate their roles into our project with the COVID patient. Maybe they could take it away with that. Yeah, so I'm Sarah. I'm the, the physical therapist that Meredith just mentioned. Um, I find it hard just because of how hands-on physical therapy is to envision a world in which we do majority telehealth. I know it was a big thing during the pandemic and this experience was nice because throughout my time at UNE, I didn't use telehealth with any of my clinical placements. So I think it was a useful skill in that sense. Um, but it was interesting to try and use physical therapy over telehealth just by kind of thinking functionally. And I think Tally was on the same boat of like functionally, what can we do in the moment that involves our role? And how do we describe that over the screen, like we did breathing strategies and ways she was really into dancing with her kids and how to get her back into that, which was kind of unique part of this experience. Yes, I agree. I'm Tali. I'm the occupational therapy student. Um, it was really interesting to be able to be on this interprofessional team and doing telehealth and just always remembering to like use the strengths that we have and use the resources that we do have. So relying on those like breathing exercises and things that we could just do in the moment with her and using things in her home as well um, was really helpful during this experience. It sounds like there was a lot of creativity going on. How do we make use of what we have available and how to use our resources effectively? I think that's really excellent. Sounds like a, a really telling experience. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts to sum up this? Excellent presentation. I can add something that I thought was unique about doing it, um, like through the CEC, um, was the fact that we did record all of our telehealth sessions and a big chunk of what we did for our poster was reflection on kind of the recordings. Like we went back and watched through and we took the advice that we gave each other and what our um, paid actors had, had given us for advice. And that's kind of how we really came up with what our do's and don'ts lists were. And that's something that we wouldn't have gotten if we didn't do a recorded kind of telehealth simulation like this. Can you remind me the session I just jumped from, um, there was at least one of the students from another university, um, I think in Chicago. In this example, were there students from different universities participating? I mean, yeah. to me, that's also an incredibly unique kind of component to all of this. And, and again, this idea in the future that you could be collaborating with a practitioner, you know, literally anywhere, um, you know, in terms of doing what you're doing. So I don't know, it's not lost on me sort of the, the power of that. Um, and to your point about expertise, you know, perhaps not being prevalent in certain pockets of the country and rural areas where you can tap into a content expert, you know, anywhere in the world, literally, uh, to be part of a, of a care team. So I don't know, again, I, it's, it sounds, so remind me again where some of the other students are from. I believe there was a student from Rosalind Franklin, which is just north of Chicago. We had a, a um, Rosalind Franklin has um, allopathic medicine, whereas UNE has osteopathic 
but they, everybody seems to work together really well, which is great. It's awesome. Yes, and we had students from Russell and Franklin from other programs too, but I think just from medicine in this program, in this team. That's correct. And I don't know that George was able to accompany us today. I know he's on clinical rotations and has a pretty heavy schedule right now. Say hi for us. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, on that note, I'm going to pause it here. If you'd like to continue on this telecollaboration track, you're welcome to sit tight and hang with us. And, um, but otherwise, if you'd like to navigate to another room, you're free to do so. So we'll give you a minute to do that. Thank you all. And thank you, IPTI team. We're, um, this was such a great presentation. So I'd like to welcome everybody if um, you're just joining us on the telecollaboration track. So this next presentation is from our IPTI team nine, the long haul listeners who are uh, with us today in person or live on the Zoom. And this presentation is called the Multidisciplinary Telehealth Care Approach for Our Patient with Long COVID. All right, so what we're gonna be doing today is presenting on a patient who's which has been suffering for long COVID for a while. Uh, overall, there were about nine of us who are rep representing different professions in healthcare. And we're just gonna be talking through our poster here, kind of one box at a time. Amanda is a 32-year-old woman who suffered from COVID about um, 11 months ago, and she came in to the clinic or for the telehealth with a consistent headache, um, persistent shortness of breath, and lingering brain fog. Our approach to the case relied on communication. We met regularly and created a supportive environment to share ideas, questions, and concerns from different profession backgrounds. We utilized a patient-centered approach, letting Amanda's responses and body language dictate the visit while utilizing motivational interviewing skills. We grouped similar professions together during uh, the simulations. Visit one, we took a history, and visit two was follow-up, education, and treatment plan. So our treatment plan for Amanda is to essentially cover her asthma. Um, we talked about proper inhale, inhaler use um, since she was overusing her inhaler. We did want to cover also her hypertension. She was on lisinopril, so we would switch that to Losartan to minimize any of the dry cough that she was experiencing. Um, in addition, we wanted to make sure that her anxiety was covered by initiating venlafaxine, the extended release. Um, as well as her migraine, since that was affecting her day, um, quality of life by initiating Excedrin. With respect to the obstacles we encountered, Amanda found it difficult to answer our questions and even look at the screen due to her headaches. Between our first and second encounters, her presentation to the ED for her overuse of the albuterol inhaler was a point of discussion. Her husband, Mo, was present for the second encounter and was more disruptive than productive. We had difficulty with dividing the time appropriately between the health professions. Based off what Bridget said to resolve all these obstacles we had, we incorporated calming techniques to help ground her so she can continue on with our sessions. We offered her rest from looking at the screen, which she often accepted. We utilized different therapeutic skills to further learn about what was going on, utilizing listening skills and empathy, and the social worker was able to find resources to her to reduce the cost of her treatments. We learned a lot throughout this experience, specifically that there is immense overlap between professions and each has a unique skill set to offer for each case. It is also important to trust yourself and your colleagues in order to give the patient the best experience and achieve the greatest outcomes. Finally, time is the biggest enemy, management is a skill, and repeating questions will only contribute to the patient's frustration. All right, welcome everybody. I'm going to now hand it over to Sarah Garber. Thank you, Team Nine. And I'm a little bit biased because this was my team. Um, you guys did a really great job. It was not an easy um, facilitation or simulation to do. Um, I can start off with a question unless somebody else has a specific question that they wanna go. Um, let me start out with asking about the telehealth angle of it. How hard was that for you? Did it, was it, just jarring? Did it take a while to figure out how to how to interact with the patient? How was it on your side? Um, I'm Bridget Kelly. I'm a first year student here at UNE, um, medical student. And I, so we've, I've done one simulation before through school of telehealth, but that was one-on-one. -on -one, so I was the only one in the room. This was a little bit different to adjust to, um, making sure you don't talk over um, one of the other students and making sure you don't talk over the patient as well. So it took a little bit for us to get used to, but again, I think the biggest problem we had with 
um, telehealth was just the timing aspect. Yeah, for the uh, I'm I'm a first year medical student at Chicago Medical School. My name is Luke. Um, I guess it wasn't too difficult for from our end of things, but it was challenging for the patient sometimes um, because the screen often like aggravated her headaches. So what we kind of did when I, whenever it got uh, too difficult for the patient uh, with respect to that, we just offered her to kind of like turn off her screen or uh, dim the lights or do whatever she had to do to help her from that end of things, which probably wouldn't be a problem if uh, we had seen the patient um, in a clinical setting. Do you feel like there's a future for telehealth or a place for telehealth? Yeah, um, I'm Haley. I am a first year DPT student at UNE. And I honestly like, I agree with what someone former said in um, the past presentations, uh, specifically with PT, it's hard to imagine it ever being like the main way that we approach things. But I honestly, I cannot imagine telehealth going away now. Um, and I think everybody will just continue to hone in on their skills with it. And I think now that it's being incorporated in education, which I don't know if it was in the past, um, I think that'll make a big difference because now we're actually getting simulations and being taught kind of how to handle it. So yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere, but I can't imagine it kind of taking over, but I think it will be offered. As a so, oh, I'm sorry, go on. Go ahead, Andrea. Um, my name is Andrea. I'm a PA student at UNE. Just to add to that, um, our pharmacists, we had two people from Chicago who were, or uh, Rosalind Franklin, who are joining us and our plan came from the pharmacist. So a huge part of what we did for the patient was in collaboration with someone that we never normally would have worked with. So I know that that was discussed earlier, but it was, it was great to be a part of that. Thank you. Those are all really good insights. I was just going to um, add that the first time we did the telehealth IPTI to this past version of, of our telehealth IPTI, the students' skills, everybody's skills on Zoom have increased tremendously. <laughs> so whether you know it or not, a lot of your skills have gotten much, much better and they're much more honed. So. Um, any last thoughts to sum up? All right. It looks like we are wrapping up this presentation. If you'd like to stick around for other telecollaboration track presentations, um, sit tight and stay with us. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And I agree, Sarah, I think people have really honed in their, um, their virtual skills with telehealth. Uh, All right, welcome everybody. If you're just joining us, this is the telecollaboration track. I'm Michelle Cody from the CC office at UNE, and I have with me um, Sarah Garber from Rosalind Franklin University, who's our all star facilitator for this track. I'd like to welcome the interprofessional team immersion team two, Nothing About Us Without Us. And their presentation is the client centered care through a collaborative lens to treat symptoms of long haul COVID. So here is their video. Hi, this is client-centered care through a collaborative lens to treat symptoms of long-haul COVID. I'm Eliza Burwell, Master's of Social Work student. I'm Kennedy King, Master's of Occupational Therapy student. Hi, I'm Kelsey Moulton, and I'm Master's of Science and Physician Assistant Studies student. I'm Zoe Sedaris, and I'm a dental hygiene student. I'm Brooke Sorbello, and I'm a nursing student. Prior to this experience, we were given a background of our client. We found out that she was a 39-year-old female and um, she was experiencing long-haul COVID for 11 days. She was admitted into the ICU and intubated. She had a few symptoms such as fatigue, brain fog, shortness of breath. Her chief complaint was her migraine headaches um, and her goal was to return to her job and be a stronger uh, mom to her children. So long haul COVID um, is defined as any patient who experiences continued symptoms for at least four weeks. And currently doctors still are unaware of the cause of this diagnosis. Professions that were included were allopathic, osteopathic medicine, physician's assistant, pharmacy, social work, nursing and occupational therapy. And we all collaborated in 
um, discussing the medical history, the symptoms, the patient, and um, and just getting her to where she wants to be. And including social work, um, she connected with resources and formulating the treatment plan for individual counseling. Um, some disadvantages and advantages of interprofessional teams where there were many different inputs coming from each profession, which had some benefits and drawbacks as it there was a lot of information to go through and there was a limited time to prep together. Some disadvantages of telehealth appointment was difficult to establish rapport with patient and or that not all patients are comfortable using technology and some advantages of the telehealth appointment are um, there it is COVID safe and it is effective transition of care. So for our appointments with uh, Amanda, our patient, we had uh, two 20 minute interviews and then we would have a break and then we had another interview after um, for and there was a little debrief in between. So in the end, we uh, decided to care for our patient. We switched her medications. Um, suggested individual counseling using acceptance and commitment therapy and we also referred her for physical therapy you can see her vitals uh, that were from her uh, previous in-person appointment that helped us make the decisions that we did and in our specific plans consisted of choosing for panelol as prophylaxis for her migraines um, versus using more reactive treatments such as sumatriptan. We discontinued her albuterol as it was no longer effective for her symptoms and it would also be further, further rendered ineffective with the addition of her propanolol due to medication interaction and we choose ACT over other modalities because of um, her ap application for chronic pain and uh, allowing the manager to focus on living a valued life despite chronic health concerns. If we were to be doing this again, we would definitely allow more time to meet outside to plan and make sure everyone understood all the medications that were planned and treatments as there was confusion that led to a little bit of miscommunication with the patient. Okay, I'll now hand it over to Sarah Garber. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Uh, it sounds like it was challenging, a challenging sim. What was your sort of like, what would you tell an IPTI team in the fall that they should try and work on and be aware of? I can answer um, this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I think definitely collaborating with the team outside of the um, IPTI appointments. I think that is something that we did not do. And I think that was where we struggled the most because there was a lot of confusion of different things. So I think if we communicated a little bit before the appointments, I think that could have helped us um, establish exactly what we wanna do for the patient rather than um, trying to figure it out in like the couple minutes we had right before we were, right before the patient was coming in. Um, and also just, um, understanding and like doing research, I think, on different type of medications, because I think there was some confusion, because some people had more knowledge of certain things. So I think just making sure that you have that knowledge, and if you're confused on something, um, just to write it down and, you know, do your research, you know, on your own type of thing, as well as like communicating with your group. So I don't know if Eliza, if you want to add something else. I uh, know, I think that just about covers it. Those are really good insights. Did you have a pharmacist on the team? Remind me. We did have a pharmacist um, from oh. Rosalind Franklin and he provided a lot of really um, great information. And at the same time, um, some of us are not coming from a super medical background. And so um, even so, just with the lack of time, I think that was the biggest thing is um, not having as much time to clarify some of the intricacies as we might've liked. Yes, Frank. Hi, uh, I had the honor of being one of the faculty advisors to this great team too. And um, it was a challenging um, set of uh, issues that they had to confront. And uh, you mentioned communication. 
And my question is, um, at the end of it, how did you feel about how that those communication issues were dealt with as a, as a team? I think I could best answer this one. Um, so with the situation we had, it was miscommunication on what the medication was and what it was replacing. Um, at the end, we kind of just cut conversation and we were like, hold on, there's miscommunication. And then the pharmacist, Ken, had taken back over and explained everything once more. Um, and I think that second time explaining, he also used less medical jargon. So it made it easier to understand for everyone in the group, as well as the patient, which I think made it a lot easier and helped resolve the issue before we had to sign off on the telemedicine. That is an excellent insight. Not only is it communication, but it's the right kind of communication. Interesting. Okay. And I also, I also felt the team um, regrouped very well. Because it could have gone a very different way and it didn't. It could have just ended up in mass confusion and it did not. So kudos to you. Well, great job, everybody. And we'll begin our next presentation. All right, so our final presentation today on the telecollaboration track is Interprofessional Collaboration and Telehealth Treatment Plan for a Long COVID Patient. This is IPTI Team 4 from 2021, the Empathetic Eagles. The implementation of telemedicine has risen greatly since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has prompted healthcare professionals to learn to adapt to this new environment, all while treating a new illness. As the pandemic progressed, practitioners began to treat patients with long haul COVID or those who've experienced COVID symptoms for more than four weeks. My name is Natalie Caruso, and I'm a second year medical student from Rosalind Franklin University. Our team participated in the IPTI program in the fall of 2021. The goal of this program was for different health professions to work together in teams to formulate a treatment plan for a patient with long COVID over a telemedicine encounter. And my name is Bianca Bustamante, and I am a second year medical student at UNE. Our research objective focuses on whether a patient-centered or problem-focused approach to patient care is more suitable for telehealth platforms. Our patient, Amanda Barry Mantle, is a 39-year-old who prevents with, presents with long COVID symptoms after her COVID diagnosis in April 2021. Amanda was hospitalized for 11 days, and shortly after discharge, she began experiencing excessive fatigue, cough, brain fog, shortness of breath without exertion, hair loss, and loss of taste and smell. At the time of our visit, her most debilitating symptom was persistent migraine headaches. During our encounter, we found that building rapport with our patient was challenging because it was harder to observe her nonverbal cues. For example, as we gathered Amanda's medical history, we observed discomfort in her body language due to her migraine headache. Our team occupational therapist recommended that she turn off her lights to make her more comfortable, which facilitated more patient engagement. We learned that a patient-centered approach is the best way to communicate with patients over telemedicine platforms, especially with those with chronic illnesses like COVID, long COVID. Uh, by allowing the patient's priorities to uh, guide the discussion, we empower them and make them feel that their needs are being met. By practicing active listening, by summarizing and using open-ended questions, we can better emphasize with the patient and build rapport. It is also important to set the stage for a good telehealth appointment by ensuring that the patient's environment is conducive for the visit. These strategies allow the patient to become more comfortable and more engaged. With the right practice and skills, telemedicine does not have to prevent healthcare professionals from developing a successful patient-provider relationship. Instead, it can be a great tool to provide accessible and convenient healthcare. All right, I'm going to keep my screen up so you can all um, grab that attendance link if you'd like, because uh, we welcome you all to complete, yeah, fill out this attendance form, um, which gives us great feedback for this event. And um, I'd like to now pass it to Sarah Garber from Roslyn Franklin University. Thank you, Michelle. The um, link for the attendance is also in the chat so you can just click on Wonderful. that and move 
right over to it if you'd like to. And I'll stop um, my sharing so we can look at the people. <laughs> <laughs> great, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I can start out the questions by, you know, you, you mentioned how it was important to make the the patient comfortable with telehealth. And I, and I know when you have more than one practitioner and more, more than one person on it, it can be very difficult both for the team and for the, for the patient to deal with that, especially on telehealth. How did you as a team come together to figure out how to present yourselves to the, the patient? I can talk about this. So we, um, in the beginning of each session, well, in the beginning of the first session, we introduced each student. We had them introduce ourselves, um, speak about what program they're in, a little bit about um, what the what kind of questions they were going to be asking as well. And then we also did that in the second session as well, just to give the patient a reminder, um, just in case she didn't remember who we were from the first session. And that was helpful for the patient. So she kind of knew what to expect from each person rather than... Um, just getting bombarded with any type of question from any student. And then to answer the thing about how did we like make sure she was comfortable in the setting with all the different providers helping her, um, it was kind of something we just learned as we were doing it because we didn't realize the effect that it had on the encounter. Um, we started our second encounter with all of the the medical students and the physician associate student uh, to gather the medical history. And it was pretty cut and dry, like a lot of repeated questions that we realized that the patient was not really receptive to because, you know, she's here for that one single complaint or the complaint of like long COVID and she has a migraine right now and she's just not comfortable. So our occupational therapist student, which I've never worked with before, he had a really great idea to you know make the setting for her encounter more comfortable, which would mean like turning the lights off. We wouldn't see her, but she was a lot more receptive like to the questions that we had. Uh, also, we um, had the students who weren't speaking turn their cameras off. So there was less faces at her on her computer, um, which she seemed, to appreciate as well. So a little bit of trial and error in terms of how to run the telehealth for yourselves. It sounds like you learned a lot as a team. Are there any sort of bottom lines that you would have, um, suggestions that you might give to the next DIPTI group? Um, I also think it's important, just like everyone else said, to maybe meet with your group beforehand um, a few times just to get more um, comfortable with each other as a team, um, which would be helpful for when you start to um, interact with the patient. Um, also in the future, um, not just for this program, but I think it would be helpful to have the same members on a interprofessional team so that you're used to each other already. So that when you see multiple patients in the future, you're kind of just, you have a flow. And um, I think that would be beneficial for patients as well. And then I just wanted to add uh, uh, as an aside, like I think it is important to know what skills that people have like the most of so like um letting the, those members of the, your team be allocated to those roles so that you're not repeating things and frustrating the patient those are really good insights and and i think it does really take practice to learn how to do those things i mean it is a luxury to have a known team a group of practitioners that you work with all the time um, at the same time, if you have two or three people that you work with consistently, you can easily, more easily, I should say, bring in somebody from the outside, a specialist as needed. So those sound like really good insights that you will take with you and we can pass on to the next team. So thank you so much for your, your participation and presentations. Are there any comments for summing up? I just want to echo your thanks, Sarah. It's been great work, like you said, trial and error for these teams today and great work, everybody. And thank you, Sarah, for facilitating and leading with such wonderful questions too, and getting really great conversation going. Thank you, Michelle, for hosting us and keeping us straight. Well, great to see all this wonderful work. 
Well, again, thank you all so much. Um, as we had mentioned at the beginning, you'll be able to watch these um, in full. We'll have an archival version of this entire series of events in the next week or so. And also for your friends and family who uh, would like to watch, we'll also have this on Facebook Live as well. So you can watch after the fact. Great job, everybody. Our first presentation for the research track is going to be dental health and medical health. Um, so if Hannah and Grace want to prepare themselves just to introduce themselves and then we'll play your video. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get, we'll get started. Great. Um, so my name is Grace Linder. I am a first year at the uh, UNE College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this opportunity has been really interesting, really eye-opening. I'm very curious to see what my colleagues have been working on um, because I know that I gained a lot of insight from this experience. Um, my colleague, Hannah, I believe that she's still working with patients right now um, just because of her schedule. Sometimes things run over. So I'm going to be presenting on the behalf of both of us. Um, but Hannah Post is a student at the College of Dental Medicine. Um, and we brainstormed this idea while attending a leadership conference hosted by the School of Pharmacy, realizing that there was a lot about um, these two fields that overlap um, and knowing that we could do a lot more to educate our patients about that. Thinking about your heart health, diabetes, or even dementia related illnesses, but believe it or not, your dental health and medical health are intricately linked. Hello, my name is Grace Linder. I'm a student at the College of Osteopathic Medicine, and I worked alongside Hannah Post, a student at the College of Dental School, to develop an educational pamphlet that provides students with measures they can take to maintain their oral health and therefore their overall health. We would like to thank our advisor, Professor Eileen Gumpy, for her con contribution to our interprofessional collaboration and her mentorship. Before we take a look at the educational pamphlet, we would like to cast a light on the vast overlap between dental health and some of the most prevalent diseases plaguing our country. About one in 10 Americans are diagnosed with diabetes. Studies have shown that individuals with poorly controlled glycemic index are at a higher risk for periodontitis. Additionally, we can see various links between the bacteria of the oral cavity and the heart, the respiratory system, and even the brain. This link suggests that good oral health can have improved health outcomes for coronary artery disease, untreated or antibiotic resistant respiratory infections and dementia related illnesses. It's crucial for dentists and physicians to not only be educated on the intersection of oral and medical health, but also educate their patients about it and provide them with strategies to maintain good oral health. The pamphlet that we created is meant to provide them with strategies to maintain good oral health. It offers things such as recommendations for regular dental checkups and cleanings, regular medical visits and compliance with medications. It recommends that people brush their teeth twice a day and floss once a day, avoid tobacco products, as well as using fluoride in oral products such as toothpaste and mouthwash. It's also important to eat a balanced diet and have it be low in sugary food as well as drinks. We believe that providing this type of education is going to be key to helping reduce these prevalent diseases and improve overall patient outcomes. Okay, I have just dropped a couple links in the chat. The first one um, to a clear image of the poster and the second to an educational pamphlet. Uh, me and Hannah, although we can do a deep dive into the uh, papers published about the overlap between dental and medical health. We wanted to put something together that made sense to the community, made sense to um, clinics, uh, both medical and dental, that they could provide to patients with uh, very uh, like smart goals, so to speak, so very actionable items. Um, something that I want to acknowledge here is that not everybody has access um, or can afford or has the resources um, to take care of their dental health, um, let alone their medical health. We know that uh, some jobs don't cover dental health, um, some health insurances don't cover dental health, and so we have a lot of work to do there in uh, terms of providing that opportunity to people uh, to maintain those. So what our poster is doing is really speaking to uh, the connection between what's happening in the oral cavity and the rest of the body. 
um, this is something that continues to um, surprise me, <laughs> um, but also give me hope because we have so many systemic diseases in this country, um, as mentioned in that presentation. And we're constantly looking for ways to prevent them and to treat them. And it seems that the oral cavity actually offers a lot of potential for prevention of these systemic diseases. And I think that that's you know, a huge goal of osteopathic medicine, as well as all other healthcare professions, right, is to prevent these things from happening. Um, and so making sure that you know, I'm speaking to my dental counterparts and understanding that you know, I have a responsibility to mentor my patients and say, hi, like, when was the last time that you went to the dentist? Is your dentist doing a full oral exam uh, to catch things like oral cancers? Um, I was reminded that your dentist should always be doing a full oral exam uh, of all areas, because that's not something that maybe me as a doctor am routinely doing. And so that's really about optimizing uh, this healthcare that we should all be all be receiving um, and really how we can support each other in that. Um, some other things. Was everyone able to access the poster? Just if I could get a read on that. No, not working. No, okay. Um, well, I can speak to some of the things on it um, in terms of what was covered, uh, briefly mentioned in the introduction video uh, is our understanding of Alzheimer's. And um, some of you may know that that is related to the beta amyloid protein and um, infections in the oral cavity have been associated with increased production of this beta amyloid protein. So just there is, there is an association um, and something to be aware of. Um, it kind of reminds me, taking a look at this project just reminds me that just like we talk about the gut microbiome, we need to remember that the oral cavity is almost included in that, right? Um, and so it's really the oral cavity is just an extension of this growing conversation that we have about um, the gut microbiome. Uh, so we talk about nutrition in our poster uh, and in the ways that that obviously can lead to uh, caries or um, cavities, which Hannah would be much more well-versed in describing, but also diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Um, we know that cancer is associated as well, respiratory diseases, we know that the respiratory system is connected to the oral cavity, um, and even dentists being able to detect um, from the health of gums whether or not a patient needs to be evaluated for diabetes. Um, so there's all and of these- Grace, I'm gonna interrupt yeah. you and, and thank you for this great presentation. Oh, yes. um, I think at UNE we have a, a unique opportunity to think across disciplinary lines in our body systems. I'm a psychologist, so I think about the inputs of mental health to physical health. And this artificial distinction between oral health and physical health is, has been problematic on many levels. So I think, I think this is a great way of getting the word out. And I really appreciate your enthusiasm. We are ready to move on though, to keep time with our next um, poster. Thank you for reminding me of the time. Um, thank you everybody for being in that session and hearing about this poster. Really appreciate your time. Enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you so much. That was excellent information. I think that's us. Is Hannah in the room right now? I am. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so for the next poster, um, you'll hear me talking a lot on there, um, but I'm joined today to further the discussion with some of my colleagues, if they'd like to introduce themselves. My name is Maura Judd. I'm a last semester ABSN student at the Portland campus. Hi, I'm Julie Geldner. I am a soon to graduate occupational therapy student, second year. I'm Anna Cook. I'm a third year PT student about to graduate. And I'm also a third year PT student graduating this May. Hello everyone, my name is Hannah Jones. I'm a third year physical therapy student at UNE. I'm here to present for my team on the UNE WHA Wellness Fair's insight into aging culture from an interprofessional student team perspective. We'll leave a lot of the discussion of the specific events that took place during the summer 2021, fall, winter 2021, and upcoming spring 2022 events for our question and answer and discussion time. And I would like to just highlight um, some of the different data from our poster. So as a overview, Westbrook Housing Authority or WHA 
provides affordable quality housing to over 650 residents ages 55 and over in 12 plus buildings throughout West Brook, Maine. Their mission statement is to provide opportunities for affordable quality housing to assist individuals and families and to encourage independence within a supportive community. And the UNE Wellness Center was invited to join WHA in early 2020 and officially open to residents use in fall 2021 after the inaugural wellness festival. So what is a mini wellness fair? This was an extension of the inaugural WHA wellness festival or fair as you will that took place in July of 2021. Um, originally as a way to efficiently engage many residents and to invite them to get to know UNE students and the wellness center. So this first started as a way to collect data for needs assessment um, to understand the services that residents needed the most and activities that they were interested in to improve community spirits, quality of life, physical health, emotional health, brain health, um, all these areas that you can see data collected um, on the right side of the poster. Um, so this was a way for students to engage with residents and to perform these needs assessment interviews um, and understand the types of activities that they would like. So then these activities that they indicated that they enjoy doing, we use that data to um, plan for our future mini wellness fairs, which are smaller versions of the original wellness festival. So this is also an opportunity to bring resources and activities directly to the residents and their buildings, so improving accessibility. Um, so this was definitely an interprofessional work um, trying to host these events. Um, definitely not just one person and definitely not one uh, profession would be able to provide the holistic events that we did um, without the multiple perspectives from everyone involved. The CC mini grant also provided an opportunity for students to collaborate and work together to plan and implement the events. Um, there was also an opportunity at the original wellness festival where students from Tufts University School of Medicine main track joined uh, UNE students to uh, help with the needs assessment and host the event. And so that's one of the future implications that we would like to continue is to make this even more interprofessional, invite uh, students from the Tufts University School of Medicine and other surrounding area schools to join us in efforts to make this even more of an interprofessional intercollegiate event. And then to also think about expanding the fairs to other marginalized groups in our community, offer interpreter services for those that have uh, English as their second language and to support cost for events such as this with fundraising efforts. And then something that is already in the works is using the remaining funding from the John T. Gorman Foundation for uh, offering residents in-home assessments from occupational therapy students at UNE uh, beginning this summer. So this was a very brief overview of the work that we did with uh, Westbrook Housing and these many wellness fairs and the Wellness Festival. We would like to encourage lots of questions and lots of rich discussion during our question and answer period, where we'll discuss more about the intricacies of each uh, event and addressing any further questions on the information that I left out here on the poster. Um, please feel free to reach out with any questions and to peruse the poster with all of its great information that we provided here. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to discussing this further. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hannah and team. I'm curious in the few minutes we have to talk about this, if you have a personal story of a resident that one of you interacted with that touched you or or could, could personalize this because there are so many different aspects of this project. Um, but I, I have a story, I can kick it off a little bit. So I was at the inaugural summer festival um, at the uh, Nature as Nurture booth and the social health and wellness booth. And 
Something that overall struck me for the assessments there, we did interviews about people's social and emotional health and wellness, was that, was that oh, sorry, that was an echo. Um, people would uh, list their physical health as being perhaps poor or even worse, but then oftentimes they would list their social and their mental wellness as being above okay, as being good or better. And I think that as a younger person coming in, I made a lot of assumptions that people with these many diagnoses and these many um, physical health problems would be depressed and would be, you know, just like not enjoying life. But these people had a lot of, even with their um, limitations, had so much love for life. They had good support. They had things that were really actually boosting their mental health during the pandemic. So that was just something that I really noticed. Um, I think for me personally, just in, for the sake of time, I'll just jump in there. Um, there was one gentleman, the first uh, wellness fair, sorry, I tried to find the quietest room possible and it's not. <laughs> um, he came to the dental, the oral health tent and had maybe three stubs of teeth left in his mouth. Um, but the fact that he actually had a person to talk to who was considered a professional, who was approachable and not in a uniform and was out in at this wellness fair instead, fair, of, instead, of, having, oh, instead of having to make an appointment with a person that he could just show up and express his concerns about his oral health, ask for help, get references to resources and um, and then also feel heard and witnessed in that whole very approachable setting of the wellness fair. I thought was just a great example of how these fairs can reach out to the community in an approachable way and in an effective way um, that makes a great impact. Yeah, terrific. Sorry, I had technical problems and had to come back in. So. Uh, Unfortunately, we're right at that point of having to switch, I think, to our next poster, but that is also about Westbrook, and we'll have more time to talk about it after that's done. Thank you so much. That's excellent. On this series, would like to introduce themselves. Um, please feel free to do so, and then we'll start your video. Rina, Gunnar, yeah, there you go. Miguel. Yes. Hey there. Hey, everyone. My name is Miguel. I'm a first year physical therapy student, and uh, we also have Gunnar on here as well. Hey, how's it going? My name is Gunnar, first year PT student. Um, excited for this to get going. Hi, my name is Marima, and I'm an occupational therapy student who worked alongside Gunnar, a DPT student, Miguel, another DPT student, um, and we worked within the Westbrook Housing Authority and got the opportunity to perform a series of health and wellness seminars for the residents. Within each, each seminar, we presented on a specific theme and came with raffle prizes that were associated with that, team, that theme. For example, during the mindfulness seminar, we gave away oil diffusers and stress balls to complement the theme of mindfulness and reducing stress. The CC mini grant that was graciously awarded to our team has allowed us to incorporate prizes like these during every seminar, resulting in satisfied residents evidenced by the positive survey outcomes uh, presented in the poster. As students, we learned how to communicate and empathize and welcome the older adult population through informative presentations, activities, and conversations. This allowed the physical therapy and occupational therapy students the chance to collaborate with one another for events to, del to deliver professional and appropriate information. Given our background and unique knowledge we have learned so, so far in our program, we each brought unique ideas and perspectives and knowledge into the sessions. One of the biggest takeaways after giving the presentations was the impact that we made for those in attendance at the Westbrook Housing Authority. Despite the small turnouts, we were able to connect with the residents in a more personable way. We would like to thank Dr. Elizabeth Sire, Professor Elise Austinson, Reggie Robinette, Tom Muser, Professor Elizabeth Cramsey, Michelle Coe, Chris Hall, and Chris Hall for the endless amount of support and knowledge and guidance through this whole process. Terrific. Thank you all. So, and I, 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 the fact that you may have only reached a small number of people in these doesn't negate the power and meaning of this work because you're helping us build this collaboration 
with Westbrook Housing. And I think I'll, I'll give the same question to all of you about this experience, those of you who uh, ran it, uh, Gunnar Miguel. Uh, did you have a, a personal connection or, or experience with one of the residents that really touched you as part of this? Um, I'm trying to think here. I don't remember having a specific conversation with a, uh, with a specific uh, resident, but I do remember one of our, uh, one of our meetings was, it, it was very intimate. It was only about seven or eight residents. And we did get to talk about a lot of situation or a lot of topics that normally wouldn't be brought up. And we were talking a little bit about family and how to cope through, through this season, uh, through the spring season. And I thought that time was really, uh, was really intimate in terms of just hearing what they had to say and, and some of their coping strategies. I think that was the biggest standout for me this semester. <laughs> Thank you. I, got how about observe, I got to observe one session and I was so impressed with how the okay. students facilitated the group, how lively the group discussion was, how much everybody enjoyed being together. Right, right. It was great. How about for you, Miguel? Did you have any, uh, any, or, I'm sorry, Gunner? I'm, I'm... Um, yes, I've, I've done a couple of events at uh, Westbrook Housing and when, every time I went, I'd see um, some familiar faces, which was really nice. Um, I got to build some connections with them. Um, the the um, presentation we did, there's maybe like four or five people there. So we had some time after and we got to talk to some of the uh, some of the people there. And, you know, just face to face conversation was really nice with them. Um, got to see some of like their beliefs. Um, I think. Yeah, the one we did was like on like goal setting and how that can kind of be tough for people that age. Um, it gave me like a better perspective on, you know, just like dealing with that kind of population of people. So that was really nice. Mm -hmm. Mothers in this room, questions or comments? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for the presentation. So this question is coming because I just came from two presentations that were focused more on telehealth. So I know this was in person um, and our ability to do that in part is because of the proximity of the campus to this facility. And I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on could this have worked in a, in a telehealth modality or the other question I had is continuing to maintain connectivity in between the in-person visits to the, to the campus and any, any thoughts about either of those from your respective disciplines. Well, Mike, I think that's a great point to bring up because, as we know, telehealth is well needed in Maine, and the majority of Maine uh, patients and clients are going to be geriatric or elderly. So it seems like an ideal setting. However, I would say that part of the most uh, the most joyous part part of the experience was actually the in-person contact. And it really was where the rubber met the road where I said, oh, this is why I'm in this health program. You know, otherwise, if I was on another tele meeting, I probably would be way less enthusiastic about the project itself. And I think it also wouldn't meet the, ne the needs of the residents necessarily because they are elderly. They're living for the most part singly in individual apartments. And community settings are really what keeps their mental and emotional health in the, you know, higher range. Um, but then also that interprofessional collaboration in person where these, you know, water cooler conversations take place, that's invaluable. And in the Zoom format, as we know, it's only one person can speak at a time and there's no mingling per se. So I agree maybe as a what you brought up is using it perhaps as like a way of maintaining a maintenance visit with someone, sure. But I think the heart and soul and Tom did a great job of kind of garnering like lots of excitement and involvement around it because it was in person and it was in, you know, a community setting. So th that's my two cents. <laughs> Thanks. That was a great response. Anybody else have a comment on that question? Um, I have a comment on that. Um, I wor was working with you, Tom, with the nutrition project we were doing at Westbrook. And yeah, I, I don't think that if we had to do anything with these residents on telehealth, I think it would have been a real struggle for all of us because just when we were doing all the pre stuff and we had it on an iPad, it was 
really hard to navigate that technology with the residents at Westbrook Housing. So it's wonderful that we were able to do all these different things with them in person. Because I, I don't think personally it would have worked on telehealth. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Amanda. I mean, I think this integration of in-person with digital contact and support is important. And I think it is the wave of the future for us. Uh, but how we do it and when, I think, still is an open question. And we've learned in some of these, and thanks, Amanda, for that comment, because in that project, we learned that the tech support needs of, of this population were very significant. And if we didn't plan ahead well enough for those, we were in trouble. So I think we're coming up on, uh, I think another time switch. Is that true, Elise, or do we have another 10 minutes to talk about this? So you do have another 10 minutes to talk about it. Um, I'm going to share my screen just real fast for the next minute in case anybody comes into our track and they're unsure of what we're gonna be talking about. So um, go ahead and take like a one minute break or maybe think of some more questions. I think a few people had asked in the chat and be prepared to come back and answer them in about one minute. So while we're in this pause period, I'll just uh, maybe speak just briefly to sort of my vision for the fall semester at Westbrook. And this has really been an evolution in this partnership such that last fall, we came off this really amazing in-person uh, wellness fair that Hannah spoke about in the first presentation on Westbrook. And we began to implement programming. So we implemented dental hygiene services, and that's been a slam dunk. Um, and it's been really interesting as the word has gotten out further, we're getting, just in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten flooded with calls of people, and we're now scheduling into the fall for oral health care at Westbrook, so really exciting. Oral health is, is an anchor service that provides an opportunity for us then to link residents with other services, so an example of a, of a linkage is uh, a course that Marissa uh, Lyon is teaching this term. Some of you may have been over to do balance and fall risk assessment with residents. Many of the people that were assessing for balance and falls came to us through the oral health. And um, similarly with social work, we've had these kind of interconnections. My vision for this coming academic year is to shift away from ad hoc service learning programming. Not that we're going to stop that, but more to integrate the Westbrook resource and our, and our really growing level of trust with residents to specific courses where we, we build into a course in PT or OT or social work or whatever the discipline, um, a specific assignment uh, and project that benefits both the learning objectives of the course as well as the uh, residents. I recently sent an email to all faculty in Westbrook College inviting um, them to build Westbrook into their fall syllabi, something I didn't do last year because I really had no clue how successful this partnership would be. I have 10 faculty who have reached out to me wanting to build Westbrook into their formal fall syllabi, which to me is a tremendous win. So for others who've engaged in this type of service learning experience. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there are other kind of life or professional lessons from this that you're gonna take with you. Anybody have anything you wanna add or share about that? Something you're gonna take with you. Courtney, are you, were you going to share? Sure, so I'm Courtney, I'm from physical therapy and I'm a first year. And this fall, we learned a little bit about motivational interviewing and kind of just kind of how to talk to an older person that you might not have had experience with. So we got the amazing opportunity to work in small groups and do some just general interviewing with some of the Westbrook housing patients. And it was just an amazing opportunity. We got to learn so much about them, so much into their lives that maybe you wouldn't ask on your day-to-day -day visits of what do you imagine a good day? Or how do you imagine, you know, your death even? Like kind of talk about hard concepts like that. So that was really nice to kind of step aside from, okay, does your back hurt? Where does it hurt? How much is your pain kind of deal? Um, and kind of bringing those questions and figuring out more of like the actual person as a whole into your patient visit. So that's one takeaway I took. Yeah, thank you. You know, we, I think we all within our disciplines will tend to focus on what our 
um, checklist for a, a session uh, or evaluation includes. And it's hard to spend the time sometimes to get to know people in a more deep or personal way. And yet I think from what Courtney just shared, there's great richness and opportunity in doing that for the, for the care encounter as a whole. And were you gonna share something? I saw you nodding, but I wanna call on you if you're not gonna share anything. I can share. Um, I just, I totally agree. Like building that connection with residents or future patients is just really important. And so um, during one of the, the mini wellness fairs during the winter, um, I had a resident that I was chatting with and she talked about how her mother had recently um, died and that she was going through a hard time and that she just really appreciated that this was something that could get her out of her apartment and to take her mind off of things and she just really enjoyed too just talking with me and having someone there to support her so just providing opportunities like that and not underestimating um, the power of a connection and just asking people how they're doing it really goes a long way thank you tom so, there was oh. go ahead I was just going to say there was recently um, the pharmacy department held an interprofessional conference, and one of the things that they had brought up as a, a need for more exercise with is communication. And I mm -hmm. feel like the Westbrook housing project um, that or the collaboration that we have with them gives us a forum in which to actually practice what as a um, Carolyn, I think it were said earlier, you know, that she got to practice motivational interviewing, like that's a communication technique, or um, even getting to communicate with a, an aging population, which we will need a lot of practice with once we get out into the main healthcare arena, because this a WHA represents so much of what the main population is. It's a great sampling of who we'll be dealing with in Maine. Um, and so knowing, getting to know that population in an intimate way ahead of time really will help us to target their needs once we get into the professional arena and know how to approach them and communicate with them in a therapeutic way. Mm -hmm. So it's a, just a great training wheels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for that comment, Maura. I, I, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of an instant we had um, this semester where we had a panel come in and speak with one of the PT classes. Now, this was a panel of our legacy scholars uh, talking about their experiences with one aspect of aging. But I could see a panel with residents from Westbrook coming in and speaking with a class about their experiences in healthcare encounters. Um, and you start talking to older adults, and you'll quickly find examples where people feel like they've been discounted, not listened to, talked down to, or the classic yelled at. You know, people raising their voice because, well, you're old, therefore you can't hear. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And um, if anyone listening is teaching such a class or involved in one, I'd love to arrange such a panel. Any other comments before we, we finish this up? Any of you who've been at Westbrook, if you, if you had all the money in the world, is there like a project you think, oh, I'd love to do there if I could, if I had the money and the support to do it? I just thought it's so fabulous that we are connecting um, college students with people at Westbrook Housing, but what about connecting younger children too? Are there any efforts in that direction? Because we know how rich those kind of intergenerational connections can be, just a win-win for everybody involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have not to date, but I, I'm, a, I'm familiar with a place out in Cleveland, a long-term care facility that is co-located with the daycare center, mm -hmm. where the older adults interact with the children and how enriching that is. And um, yeah, that would be really, really interesting to try to do something like that uh, with the Westbrook population. You know, something else that I notice with the Westbrook residents that I don't notice with our legacy scholars um, is kind of a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs thing. Our legacy scholars are often more educated, um, retired professionals who I find have a lot more time for enrichment yeah. activity. Legacy, yeah. our, our folks at Westbrook, a lot of them are dealing with really basic needs. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so um, 
And but one of those basic needs is a need for socialization and, and mattering or meet or personal meaning that you matter to others. And I think that's something where a young child interaction with a resident could be really cool. Mm -hmm. So we have, I just saw the uh, little flash up there. So Lisa, I guess we're going, we're going to be moving ahead to our next. Um, and Yes, I will go ahead and share my screen and we'll begin our next presentation at 1251. So everybody has like a minute to move around if there's any last minute um, switches you have to make. All right, so our final presentation of the day um, is improving pharmacy education and patient-centered care through virtual reality. Um, and is Kristen here? Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Sullivan. I'm a P2 student, so I'm, a, I'm in my second year of pharmacy at the UNE School of Pharmacy. Um, I got to work with Dr. Nichols and a lot more uh, of the pharmacy staff, as well as Brian Piper on this um, research project. Um, I'm super excited to talk about it today. Uh, let's do this. Hi, everyone. My name is Kirsten Sullivan, and I'm a second year pharmacy student currently working alongside Dr. Nichols in her research. I quickly want to acknowledge and thank the other faculty and mentors that have helped us in our research. Dr. McCall from UNE School of Pharmacy, Brian Piper from Geisinger School of Medicine, and Susan Woods from Generated Health. And to Dr. Nichols from the School of Pharmacy for this opportunity. Empathy is the ability to understand one another's feelings. It is an extremely important skill to have within any health field, but it isn't something that is easily taught. In order for someone to fully understand a patient's emotions, they must truly recognize the patient's disease as well as their perspective. In this study, we aim to explore the impacts that immersive virtual reality, or VR, experiences have on student pharmacist knowledge, attitudes, and anticipated behaviors, specifically in regards to Alzheimer's disease. Participants completed one or more of the three simulated VR modules offered by Embodied Labs, called the Beatrice Lab. This program allowed for students to experience Alzheimer's disease through first-person perspective, as it involved realistic visual and auditory disturbances, language comprehension struggle, and symptoms of aphasia. After completing modules, students then completed several short essay prompts, assessing their self-perceived empathy and anticipated changes to patient-centered care as a result of the activity. These responses were split into meaning units, as seen on the right. For example, one student wrote, seeing this experience will definitely help me as a future pharmacist to make sure that I am expressing empathy in patients that have difficulty understanding what may be going on with them. We then condensed these units into codes, allowing us to recognize overarching themes. For example, we coded the ideas, communication and isolation, feeling like a burden, scared and helpless, confused, altered perception, together and created the theme of understanding the dementia experience. Using VR to supplement didactic pharmacy education is a useful tool, as data reflected that after completing this experience, students reported an increased understanding of dementia, recognition of the importance of empathetic and patient and family-centered care, as well as the ability to identify anticipated changes in future practice, such as approaching calmly and slowly and building trust and rapport. Thank you for listening and for this opportunity. Okay, so any any of the those on this poster wish to share anything more with the group? I would just say, hi, um, this is Stephanie Nichols. I'm sorry I'm off camera and you might hear in my voice. I've got home really late last night, 4 a.m. from a delayed and diverted flight, but enough about that. Um, I'm just really proud of Kirsten and all the work you've done. I know that we presented some of our work as well uh, in a national conference presentation just this past weekend. You weren't able to, to join, but um, yeah, so I'm just really proud of you and, and I'm excited to hear the discussion here. I have nothing to add about the research itself. What, what does virtual reality offer that maybe watching a video on a, on a flat screen uh, doesn't? I mean, what, what, what is the value added of virtual reality? Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I guess the biggest thing for um, virtual reality, as well as the program that we used for it, is the fact that um, even before the module begins, um, when you put on the headset and hold the controllers, 
like everywhere you look around you is the module. You see what's projecting. Um, and you also have the option to like use your hands through the controllers as well. So even before the module begins, you're able to look at the brain and the different parts of the brain that um, Alzheimer's affects. Um, another thing is, is the, the biggest takeaway from this project that I believe and what virtuality I think helps um, is the fact that empathy is so hard to teach. Um, there was, um, back when I was an undergraduate, this is, I guess, a story, but a few years ago when I was in the undergraduate program, um, my dean, the dean of pharmacy school, who I see was able to join, um, Dean McCarthy, he came and visited our class and he was telling us that when you work in the pharmacy, at the end of the day, anyone that comes into the pharmacy is there because they have a health issue. Um, so they're not always in the best, uh, in the best mood and that might come off at you. But I think with virtual reality is that it teaches you, um, from the patient's perspective, what they're going through and why they may communicate in the way that they do to you. Um, I think by using virtual reality as a way to supplement, um, education, um, really influences the way that we see patients and how we understand empathy. And that was also shown in our research. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, this is kind of a, a follow-up question. Can anyone who, who was on the project share, um, you know, one thing that's very tangible that you would, so it, empathy is hard to measure, but you kind of know it when you see it. So I'm curious, you know, one take home you say, and it may be a small thing, but this is something through this experience. I know when it, if I encountered this, I, I'd behave differently. And this is like, what would, what would that be? Um, I hope I understand the, the question correctly, but I think um, for me, when, I, when me and Dr. Nichols were going through the different responses students had towards it, a lot of them, and we included one on the poster. I hope you guys could see the poster because I know it's a little blurry. Um, a lot of students were able to make their own metaphors and analogy uh, of Alzheimer's disease to something else. Like the one that we included uh, was the feeling of like untangling a, uh, a necklace and how that feels or um, feeling isolated and lonely. Um, or the struggles of when you are the patient, the patient will try to communicate and they aren't able to efficiently. What they're thinking, they're not able to verbalize. And so um, I hope that answered it and that I interpreted it correctly, but I think that was a big um, identifier of the empathy. Thank you. Other, other question, questions or comments from the group? I know I had a chance to try out one of the, I don't think it was this scenario. I tried out one of the other ones from uh, Embodied Lab. And um, the, the, the idea of taking the, the visual perspective of another person uh, in this it, it is so, for me, was so different than just watching a static video on a screen. That, that that modality for me personalized the interaction in a way I don't think I could have experienced any other. I'm so glad you brought that up because um, another, uh, another thing that students consistently brought up when reflecting was the idea that at the end of the day, um, they could take off the headset and go on with their days, whereas patients that do suffer from different diseases such as Alzheimer's, which was what we studied, can't do that. And so I think that's an excellent reference to that. What was your personal experience, Chris, Kirsten, with um, experiencing Alzheimer's? Um, so it was actually very interesting. Um, this, so this experiment was done on third year students and I'm only in my second year. So I haven't had any experience um, through the classroom with mental health or any, any other disorders. Um, so this was really like my first time experiencing any sort of um, mental disorder. And so I think it was really eye-opening seeing like, you know, when you read textbook definitions, it'll say uh, trouble communicating but I don't think you really understand what that means until you do take on the perspective. Um, 
or uh, like in the module, there's this one part where the patient believes that like something harmful is knocking on the door. Whereas, you know, that can't be the case, but that's your only perspective. So I think it was really interesting to see how patients live compared to the textbook definition of it. So it looks like we're just at the end of our time. I want to thank all of our poster presenters for sharing their amazing work. And as Bob is indicating, I think uh, a, a round of applause is more than appropriate. Um, the opportunity to share in this way, the Zoom platform is less personal, but I'll tell you, we just heard a ton of information that would be hard to get any other way. So kudos to the organizers. And um, I believe this is where we say goodbye. So um, uh, at least you correct me if I'm wrong as the uh, room moderator. Do, we don't go back to the main room, do we? Nope, this is the end of um, the poster presentation. If you haven't done so already, please fill out the attendance form. Um, I just dropped the link in the chat. And yeah, thank you all so much for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day. Be well, everyone. Take care. Hello, everyone. My name is Colleen, and I am a senior medical biology major. And I'm Carolyn, a senior applied exercise science major. Each fall, the IHS 130 Interprofessional First Year Experience course is taught to first year students in health professions majors to introduce them to the healthcare field and support successful collegiate transition. Peer teachers are upperclassmen students who co-teach the IHS 130 course with their partnered instructor. Carolyn and I worked together last semester as co-lead peer teachers. As lead peer teachers, we collaborated with a faculty member, Colin Bader, each week to provide continuous support to the peer teachers. By sending out weekly communication and hosting monthly meetings, we served as guidance for peer teacher leadership development and in turn supported the first year students transition to the first year of college. To give a bit of background, Colleen and I both had previously been peer teachers in the classroom setting. We had some previous knowledge of the nerves of standing in front of the classroom as a student for the first Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. To lead some students who were not gasping the full concept of the information being presented. The first presentation, by discussing which with is Colleen student and leadership and the rest and of the teachers, peer we were teaching. able to create a list of alternative solutions to try and help the scenario. Which brings us to the main objective of us sharing this project. The importance of having support through any transition, especially in our setting where we are attempting to reach the main three goals of success in college for all, preparation for the healthcare force and knowledge of self and others. Develop professional skills, cultivate campus connections, and of course, develop wellness practices for a balanced lifestyle. Exploring the process of team development and practices for effective collaboration. Enhancing knowledge of learning styles, personality types, and emotional awareness to promote success in academic endeavors and relationships. In the middle here, you can see a diagram emphasizing our goals and how we achieve them through the interpersonal connections. We mentioned some of our forms of outreach already, but as you can see there, we also held an orientation to help our peer teachers adjust into their roles and hosted an ice cream social for our peer teachers and all of their students to attend so they could grow that bond together. Throughout all of this, our methods proved to be having that effective communication available 24 seven to all students involved in the program, surveying our peer teachers to, to ensure that they were getting what they wanted out of the role and really promoting self-reflection to develop however fit for that individual. We helped develop them as leaders through reflection of their individual experiences by having them elaborate on what they learned and how they pushed through any challenges. Therefore, everyone could uniquely grow in their own experience. Although we had a successful semester with our group of peer teachers and one another, we have continued to work with faculty to revise the IHS curriculum to give students perspective to help them enhance an interactive and engaging learning environment for future students. This is because we gained so much knowledge from the peer teachers and how just some minor adjustments to the classroom agenda could make the learning outcomes of the course so much more fulfilling for all of the students. Yes, we will help do this through promoting the use of speakers, creating a case study and more. To close, we would like to thank Colin for all of her help in making these roles fun and so successful. 
She allowed us to really take the reins and help us navigate how to make our ideas come to life. Her passion for wanting to help all of her students really shows and is something that Colleen and I will both take with us into our future career. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Megan, for playing that video. Thank you so much to Colleen and Carolyn for that excellent presentation. We now have a few minutes for discussion, about five minutes. Um, so if you feel comfortable unmuting, sharing your, your video and asking questions that came to mind, uh, we have Colleen and Carolyn here who are ready to um, answer any questions that you have. So what questions, comments came up? Yeah, I see one from Professor Hussman. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you both for that presentation and for the work you did with the peer um, teachers this semester. I, I'm just wondering, you know, um, being that you work together in this co-role, leading the other peer teachers, I'm wondering what um, were some of the successes and challenges that you experienced as co-leaders in that role? I think that um, we had a lot of success with like growing our relationships with the peer teachers. Um, that's something that Carolyn and I worked um, throughout the semester with Colin. Um, we would send them monthly emails um, and we would like kind of message them over group me um, and have them reach out to us if we if they had any questions for us. Um, in addition, we also had monthly meetings um, where we had a little pizza night, so that was always fun, um, just to kind of talk about how things are going, how, can, how we can help them. Um, so I think that was one of the most successful things that we came across. And I would add on that something maybe, maybe difficult, but also just different for both of us was that we both were just peer teachers prior to the lead peer teacher role. Um, so kind of being on the outsider perspective and hearing about things that were going right or wrong, um, and not being able to like be in the classroom and actually experience that and just kind of give advice based on what we're hearing, um, which can only go so far. It's kind of up to the peer teacher to actually implement that in the classroom. Um, so I guess it could was kind of a challenge to like give advice, but still have to go back and forth and not actually get to be in the classroom and kind of take action ourselves. Thank you for the question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, great question, Professor Hussman. What other questions do we have for Colleen and Carolyn? So this is um, this is Kelly Fox. I'm a faculty with the School of Social Work. Uh, I'm curious about you know how this experience uh, will how you will take this experience and what you learned out into the world. I see that you're both graduating, so congratulations. Um, so I'm just curious, what have you learned that you really think will help you in your career moving forward? I think that, um, I mean, kind of what we see in all of the CC presentations is the goal of just kind of getting to work with people of different majors and stuff. I know personally for Colleen and I, we had a whole normal freshman year and we got to meet a lot of different people like in our majors and not in our majors, but then sophomore, junior year where we had the pandemic and stuff, I think going online and um kind of not getting to meet as many people out of our major more so than ever, because even people in our major, we didn't get to meet in person. Um, this opportunity provided both of us like a great thing where we got to meet not only people of different majors, but also um, different ages, um, people from different backgrounds, um, people with different goals. And um, I know you switched majors at some point, so maybe you could touch upon that. And how we got to meet a lot of different people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I um, actually started off in the nursing program. Um, I was very involved, um, but I got involved in a microbiology research lab on campus and found myself just loving microbiology and immunology. Um, so I decided to switch my major to medical biology. Um, it was definitely a tough transition because I was very nervous, but um, I think being able to kind of take the College of Arts and Sciences and also the Westbrook College of Health Professions has been super helpful um, because I've been able to engage with different faculty from both colleges um, and kind of be able to merge um, both of the core values from each one of those. Thanks so much for the question, Professor Fox. Thank you so much to Colleen and Carolyn for that amazing presentation. We're just almost at 12.20 now, so I think it's about time to transition to our next video presentation. I'll turn it over to Megan, and then we'll have another discussion following that. So we are an interprofessional team that work together um, to discuss and treat a patient suffering from long COVID 
we came in at the beginning of the um, project with our biases of how each profession worked and saw how those changed throughout um, the entirety of the project. So some of our biases um, for pharmacy, thought the pharmacist kind of deals with facts and drug interactions and, and indications, PAs in charge of history taking, providing basic line of care, OT, does the fine motor skills, upper extremity therapy, primarily ADLs and rehab. PT is kind of the gross motor movement and strength building with some overlap with OT. Social work um, helps patients and family transition from hospital life back to home life, and they provide some resources. And medicine is the director of the group, solely focused on medical care of the patient. So how did our biases change throughout our experience? So for pharmacy, we realized that they're very involved in the entirety of the patient care. So they take a lot of different factors into consideration, such as the family and the living situation of the patient. The physician's assistant are really well versed in treating the patient as a whole and discuss what the patient needs outside of just medicine. The OTs focus on patients' mental health and innovative care while they created a starting point using objects in the home to improve their cognitive training. PTs worked with items in the home to ensure the safety of the patient and gave them simple instructions to work on endurance training. Social work was the great motivational speaker of the group and focused a lot on the mental health of the patient and provided reassurance and validation throughout the process. And then medicine was a holistic approach and discussed mental and emotional health of the patient while taking into consideration their medical needs and examinations. So now what? Through this experience, each one of us were able to learn a lot about our individual biases. And as we came together for the um, sole purpose of treating and caring for Amanda, we began to see the overlap each of us have and learned our roles in a new way. And we're able to see other people's ideas and, as well as our own and really work together to come to treat Amanda in a holistic way. Um, if that group wants to um, share their screen so we can see them, and if anyone has any questions for this group, you can go ahead and ask them. Yes, big thanks to this group for an excellent presentation, and yeah, I'd love to hear questions from our audience, questions that came up as you were listening to their project. I think I, I have a question for this group. Um, oh, there's two hands raised too as well. My question is, um, I know as an OT student, lots of times we're provided with the opportunity to educate those that we're working with on what the role of OT is. Um, so I'm not surprised to see that discrepancy, but for the other healthcare majors that were there, was that your first time experiencing kind of a discrepancy between what your peers thought your role was and where your responsibility, responsibilities were? Or have you experienced that before and how did you maybe navigate it differently this time? Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a DPT1 student. So for me personally, I always did see the overlap of OT and PT. And even my mom, who's been a nurse for 30 years, always goes like, OT is upper body, PT is lower body. And I was like, no, that's a concept that's like very different now. Um, I do feel that that, that um, stereotype is still there. But for me, I just like to kind of state that although there are overlaps, there are other things that we're specifically looking for. You know, PTs also help with ADLs, OTs also help with gross movement. And it's just really knowing what the patient needs and being able to address them in that way. But I do think that it's still definitely more of a collaborative effort. And that's just kind of how I explain things when there's a lot of confusion between the two. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. And I know I'll turn it over to, um, we have at one hand, so please feel free to jump in with your question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rostea. I'm a first year comm student. Um, I was just wondering how long it took for you guys to realize that you had overlapping um, approaches to care and then how possible do you think it would be to kind of incorporate this more in the healthcare field as a whole? For us, it was after the first time we met with Amanda, right before we went into the second portion of the first day, we were all 
as we came together to do a debrief, we're like, oh, so they had similar questions that we wanted to ask. And we also were able to see that not one specific, I guess, practitioner are going to ask different questions, if that makes sense at all. But it was, you know, things that for me as a PT, those are the questions that our social worker was asking are things that I would have asked, you know, things that um, of their medical history of just knowing like medications and stuff were asked by both farm and the doctor. And I think in order to kind of integrate this more into our current medical system is to just keep being educated on all these different aspects of it. It's just because I'm a PT student doesn't mean that my knowledge ends with the gross motor movements. It is important that I'm getting pharmacology in so I can understand the medications my patients are on or you know, being able to talk about motivational um, interviewing and getting those kind of core foundations. I think mainly educating it and the student also wanting to learn it because I think that's so important, not just being like, oh, this is like a fluff class, but no, it's really important when we're getting out into clinics and being able to talk to our patients and understand what they need. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I know we have a question that came in through the chat. So I'm gonna read that off now. So the question is, do you feel that the chronic aspect of care featured in this is more facilitatory of interprofessional collaboration? Do you think that care in an acute setting would have been better or worse for learning roles and reducing personal biases? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I feel that the, definitely the chronic aspect was really helpful for this interprofessional collaboration because if I think of different patients I've seen or just have heard about, you're not getting a lot of the collaboration between different professions because you're like, they're in ICU, only the um, medical staff are really gonna see them. But if it's now the medical staff starts to see, oh, this person will be a really great candidate for PT or OT, that's, you know, there's almost like a chain of command. However, doing this and being able to approach it from all these different, almost perspectives of the professions was very helpful. Um, I think if it was in an acute setting, that's, I feel like that's a little hard because if it's in an acute setting and we're seeing somebody you know, in something like a nursing facility, then you definitely have more of that, that interprofessional roles. But in an acute setting for just a, ho a hospital, I think that's much harder because then their main focus is let's make sure she's stable, let's make sure that she's able to do more before she gets um, put with like a PT and an OT for just like ADLs or more movement. But I think an acute setting would have been a little bit harder to learn about like our roles and biases because it kind of comes down. We'll get all the information from the medical staff and then whomever is next will get information from there. Whereas this was definitely so collaborative on like what we wanted to ask, where we wanted to go with it. And I have one minute left. So <laughs> did that answer your question? Sorry, I felt like I talked so much. <laughs> No, that was so helpful. Thank you so much for those excellent questions and all that detail, Jessica. We really, really appreciate it and another amazing project. So I think at this point with that one minute left, it's a great time to start transitioning to our next presentation and our next video. But thanks again, that was wonderful. Hi, I'm Danielle Clymer. I'm an AES pre-med major. Hi, I'm Stephanie Burns. I'm a health, wellness, and occupational studies major, and we did our IP project on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder awareness. So first, we want to start off by defining what is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. FASD is a birth defect that occurs when a person is exposed to alcohol. Prenatal alcohol exposure causes a range of adverse physical, neurocognitive, and behavioral effects. So for our project, we created a brochure that was targeted towards healthcare professionals and families impacted by FASD. And our brochure's purpose was to educate and bring awareness about FASD as well. 
Um, there are a lot of common misconceptions about FASD. Um, one is that facial abnormalities are a common sign of an FASD diagnosis, but actually it is only seen in 10% of people with FASD. Also, um, another misconception is that all healthcare professionals receive proper education and training about FASD, and that is not actually true. They receive little training regarding FASD diagnosis. Um, the prevalence of FASD, um, one out of every 20 children in the U.S. has FASD, and that is 10 times greater in children in foster care. Um, in order to get an FASD diagnosis, um, the patient must have prenatal alcohol exposure and central nervous system or brain abnormalities. Um, the importance of treatment um, it is important to conduct a FASD diagnostic evaluation um, from birth to age three to document alcohol exposure in the medical record and begin early intervention and reevaluate at age eight to update the diagnosis. And some predictors of positive outcomes include early diagnosis and intervention, as well as a stable and nurturing home environment. And what happens to families if they do not get in, in FASD diagnosis? They're 17 times more likely to attempt suicide. Almost 50% experience problems related to alcohol and drugs. And they have legal trouble at a younger age, which may result in incarceration or time in juvenile detention. So with an FASD diagnosis, there are eight areas of occupations that OTs focus on that are impacted. So some deficits that are impacted are adaptive functioning, severe executive functioning, attention, and memory. Also sensory overload of an average or low IQ and learning disabilities as well as sleep disorders. Our goal is to spread awareness about FASD diagnosis across an interdisciplinary field of healthcare providers leading to a decrease in misdiagnoses and an increase in treatment and therapies. At this time, we'd like to thank our faculty advisor, Karen Hussman, as well as Valerie Jones, Kelsey Teagan, Shelly Cohen Conrad, Colin Bader, and Bethany Fortier for all your help. Excellent, thank you so much. I'm gonna ask the presenters to share their video so we can see them and engage them in a discussion about um, their project. So as you were listening and learning about the project they did, audience, what questions came to mind um, that you want to ask the presenting group? Yes, I see a hand. Go for it. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you guys have any ideas on the best way to approach teaching this so that it is interdisciplinary and not just taught in each separate profession? Um, I would say, especially since um it is un under like appreciated and under educated upon like being able to address it across all areas in a manner that affects everybody who's working together so I think like for example I'm in um pre-occupational therapy student going to OT school in the fall so I think especially me like I could be working with PTs OTs really anybody so just being able to approach it in a manner that is effective through everybody because we all have different approaches but as long as we all have the same like basic background information I think would be crucial. Um, just adding on to that I think since um, interprofessional care is so important with um, all the different symptoms that come with FASD um, I think just making sure everyone is on the same page with the basic knowledge like Steph said but also everyone bring their own perspective on how best to help the patient. Thank you. Yeah, excellent, great question. Thank you so much, Danielle and Stephanie. Do we have another question or comment, an idea from someone in the audience? Yes, Professor Hussman. Yeah, I, I think this, um, this kind of follows on the heels of Ostasia's um, question. And that is, so, you know, you've really identified that FASD is, is a diagnosis that few people know about or understand. It's, it's largely misunderstood. So how would you suggest if, if, you know, knowing what you know from your undergraduate education and getting ready to move on to graduate education, how would you recommend that educational programs 
um, ensure that they're teaching about these um, under under identified diagnoses? So personally, in the HOAS program, we take a uh, substance misuse and prevention course, which I think it would be very beneficial if we went in depth about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, or even just like touched upon it and like the basic of understanding what it is and how prevalent it really is and like the misdiagnosis and stuff. Because in my class, there are people who are not just going for OT. So that would come across through multiple professions. So that would be my suggestion to just implement it more in like core classes as well as like anatomy and stuff like that. Um, adding on to that, I think um, in my studies, the first time I really heard about FASD was at the CC event. So just having more events like that, that bring um, information about um, diagnoses that aren't talked about in your core classes and just making sure people are able to get that information. Great, thanks so much for the question and thank you both Stephanie and Danielle. And we have time for one more question from the audience. If anyone has something that came up in their minds as they were watching. One thing I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on is just what the interventions look like for those who are diagnosed and how that mitigates the, all those negative outcomes you, you presented, how effective and um, how successful are the interventions at promoting more positive outcomes? So the main two um, things we found to be most effective is a stable and positive nurturing home environment and early diagnosis and early intervention. So starting at that younger age, but what is happening because there's like a lack of education and a lack of training is people are getting misdiagnosed. So since they're getting misdiagnosed, they're getting mistreated as well. So for example, a common diagnosis is oppositional defiant disorder. So having getting treated with a defiant disorder, you're getting treated for a defiant disorder. You're not getting treated for FASD. So being able to get education on diagnosing properly would most likely be the first step so that the treatment correlates to the proper diagnosis. All right, excellent. Thank you both. It's about time, about 1240, about trying to transition to our next presentation. So I'm gonna turn it over here to Megan. Okay, we're going to get started. This presentation is on LGBTQ health, effective training for interprofessional emerging health professionals. Study finds that cultural competencies in health healthcare practice with LGBT patients is significantly lacking across health professions curricula. LGBT patients are vulnerable to informed care as well as biases and discrimination that as a consequence may result in healthcare avoidance and or poor outcomes. Further, lack of knowledge regarding LGBT health contributes to practitioner discomfort and low confidence when addressing LGBT needs. The goals of this event was to raise awareness of distinctive features of LGBT health needs and increase knowledge surrounding the health needs of our patients. The event was hosted on Zoom and included the, an educational part and a discussion part with breakout rooms. 40 student leaders from all professions were asked to serve in the breakout rooms as facilitators to guide conversations. There was an attendance of 76 students and faculty from different health profession programs at the event that were split into 10 breakout rooms. Prior to the start of the event, participants were asked to complete an 18 question survey known as the LGBT DOCS, which stands for Development of Clinical Skills Scale. This is a validated tool for determining changes in self-perceptions of attitudes, clinical preparedness, and knowledge of LGBTQ plus health. After the educational session, students were once again asked to complete the survey. 
An unpaired t-test was done on the responses of the overall LGBT doc score, as well as the subcategories in clinical preparedness, knowledge, and attitudes. As seen in the graphs, the overall knowledge and preparedness sections had significant clinical or significant increases in the scores. However, the attitude section did not. After the event, the interprofessional student group members discussed different approaches on including LGBTQ plus education in their professions. They discussed incorporating LGBTQ plus care into simulation patient experiences, providing appropriate education on gender affirming practice, including mental health treatment in LGBTQ patients, and then including occupational therapy in incorporating aspects in activities that provide gender affirming care. Many health professionals lack adequate training to provide comprehensive care to the LGBTQ population. This study was done to further explore the attitudes of health care professional students after attending an educational event focusing on providing interprofessional care to these populations. Using the survey, it was found that after the event, there was an increase in overall survey scores as well as significant increases in both preparedness and knowledge categories. These results would indicate that events about LGBTQ care would benefit health profession students in preparing them for working with this patient population. All right, excellent. Another wonderful presentation. Let's get some questions from our audience. Audience, what questions do you like to ask the presenting group? Yes. Um, Mike Sheldon, go. Hi, Colin, how are you? Great. I'm good, how are you? Good, great presentation. Um, so my question is, and I'm not familiar with the survey tool, um, do you get to the granularity about you know, one thing was, oh my gosh, this is going to be something that I, I'm definitely going to incorporate, like the big learn, you know, the take home. Were there a couple of things that came out that people said, you know, I had no idea about, the, but this this is great. I'm going to add this to my toolkit. Hi, I'm Ostea. I'm a first year comm student. So I think that um, the event, people had to register for it. So I think it kind of uh, goes both ways. So I think everybody who registered for the event and did go are people who are actively trying to learn about this topic and learn more. But I did hear um, from several students after um, between several professions that they did learn stuff that they hadn't heard about before. Um, does that answer your question? Um, if if I could say something, um, I was at, I was one of the student leaders in the breakout group. And um, one thing that I heard and one thing we discussed in the follow-up was simple things that people could carry through were respecting people's pronouns. And then even before that, kind of encouraging their practices or where they work to start including that on intake paperwork um, in a way that wouldn't signal anybody out and not have like preferred pronoun, but just be like, what's your pronoun? What's your, you know, gender, maybe multiple choices, maybe just blank. So you can write it in, um, you know, and having your legal name and then your, your desired name, something like that. So that it would take some of the awkwardness out of having people being like, well, I think they might be something, but just, and I have it across the board. So that was a big takeaway, I think, for people. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think there was a, a big focus, um, I'm Austin, by the way, um, on passive ways to make sure that you are being as inclusive as possible, because a lot of times those are the things that can make a difference in those first few minutes. If somebody comes into your office, especially as a new patient, how can you create a setting that is not overt or over the top, but that it makes somebody feel comfortable coming in no matter you know what their background is. And so there was a lot of discussion about just simple things such as intake forms and or you know just reading materials, um, ways that you set up the room to make people feel more comfortable, what kind of restroom access you have. Um, those are little things that you can do that can go a long way in setting the tone to make you know uh, the LGBTQ plus populations coming in feel comfortable and uh, willing to hopefully not already kind of have like their guard up before they even get into the room with you. Um, so that was one of the big takeaways for me, at least, was trying to be more cognizant of trying to find those areas where you can uh, just make those little things happen to make a difference. Thank you.
I'm Sarah, and I was another student facilitator. Um, and uh, a takeaway from our, our breakout rooms was understanding that uh, patients may have had past traumas or negative experiences that would make them hesitant to engage in healthcare. Um, and so addressing that and making it a safe um, environment psychologically and physically, um, but also recognizing that somebody's walking through the door and they may have had um, a really negative opinion of healthcare workers in the past. And so they, that might be present in the care. Hi, I'm Evelyn, a PA student, um, one of the students on the team. Uh, the takeout um, in, the, in the breakout room was that like, if we have, as a provider, we are well trained and know exactly how we're going to approach the patient clinically, then that discomfort will lessen and the patient will not see it through us taking care of it. We, it will feel that comfort and the patient also will feel like, okay, I think I'm accepted here and she know the provider really knows what she's doing or is doing. Hi, and I'm Emmy. I'm I was another facilitator in the in the breakout rooms and a part of this project as well. And something that uh, really stuck out to my group during the discussions were just like Austin was saying, how little things go a really long way. Um, and how we can work together as providers, as healthcare professionals, to educate each other and ourselves and just really be intentional and put in effort to make sure that um, everybody that we are seeing is, is getting the best care that we can provide. I think all of those are some really strong takeaways. Um, and we're really important for everyone to hear and understand, especially because this is such an important topic to truly understand and have the knowledge around, especially as future healthcare providers. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, we're going to move on to our next, we're going to wrap up this one and move on to our last presentation. But before we do that, I'm going to drop into the chat a link for our attendance. So if you could fill that out before you leave today, that would be awesome. And this presentation is on Peer Health Education. Hi, I'm Hannah Hutchins, and I'm a Health, Wellness, and Occupational Studies major. I'm Michaela Spenson, and I'm also a Health, Wellness, and Occupational Studies major. And my name is Madison Willis, and I'm a Medical Biology major. So for our project today, we participated in the Peer Health Educator Program. This program is designed to promote healthy choices and lifestyles through educating the community on campus with a variety of different topics. Because we are students, we are readily available in providing more comfortable and laid back environment for our peers to express their concerns and feelings regarding health. Peer health educators can provide non-judgmental support, act as a resource, role model, and referral agent. Some areas of focus include stress and time management, nutrition, fitness, sleep management, and many more scopes of health. As for the process of um, peer health educator, we participated in a 12 hour foundation training and it is broken up into eight modules, which we went through and they include some areas such as understanding change and the roles of peer educators, as well as being an effective listener, listener and how to be a responder. Some um, trainings that we went through as well were bystander interventions, um, how to assess interpersonal applications of identity, programming strategies, as well as group development. And students that, who are certified in this training have been trained in the core skills that will make them a better leader, role model, activist, and team member. Um, for our assessment, we collected data from UNE undergraduate students. So we sent out a survey um, just to any undergraduate, no matter who, what their major is or age or anything. And we the survey focused on the health and wellness and how it correlates to different events that are put on through um, the UNE campus. Um, we sent out questions such as what students were most interested in gaining knowledge in, and that came out to be that students were most interested in gaining knowledge on nutrition and stress management. We also asked what their biggest limitation was when it came to attending these events, and they said that they did not have enough time within their schedules to um, go to these events. Um, Another thing that we asked was what they thought, what wellness issue they thought needed to be addressed more throughout the campus. And the most common answer that we found was that mental health um, needed to be addressed more and there needed to be more resources um, provided to students um, at all times of the day and week um, for students to be able to um, address their mental health concerns. 
So when discussing applications for future health profession, I am a medical biology major and future public health professional. Um, peer health education is a really important stepping stone to the public health career in particular because both um, promote health education. In public health specifically, I would like to work in the scope of addiction crisis. And within this training, we did learn um, risk management within addiction and other habits as well. So in the field of occupational therapy, which Hannah and I as future occupational therapists um, will be using peer health education in a large portion of our work with future clients, um, being able to provide resources as well as um, being able and comfortable to respond properly to people's intense emotions and feelings during these times in our life is an important factor that we will be using in our futures. Wonderful, thank you all for another excellent presentation. So again, I'm gonna just turn it over to the audience and presenters, if you don't mind um, showing your videos, that would be wonderful. Audience members, same for you all. What questions came up as you were learning about the Peer Health Educator Program? What questions do you have for these presenters? I yes. Go ahead. Hi, I just had a question. How do you suggest um, like the school and faculty um, adjust schedules to incorporate these concerns that undergraduate students had with incorporating wellness? I think a large portion of our um, project that we did was mostly about advocacy as well as education. So I think um, professors being aware of these aspects that students are concerned about would probably pay, play a big role in being able to incorporate these into students' daily lives and being able to touch on these areas of wellness that students are so um, dedicated and feel as though they are so important to them. And to add on to that, I know that in orientation and first year experience and all those, you learn a lot about the areas of health and wellness and specifically for um, Michaela and I's major, it's health and wellness. And we do learn a lot about that, but I don't think the other majors um, have as much opportunity to really learn about it, especially um, like other science majors, such as um, obviously we have a big like marine and environmental science, and they don't really see that aspect of health and wellness. So um, even just in our first year experience classes, we learn so much. So maybe giving students the opportunity just to um, like get to know about that and learn more about it, just not within first year and as um, we move up in like uh, school. So I am the um, outlier. I'm the med bio major and I didn't have to take a first year experience class. So for my major, a lot of people, I feel like it's the health and wellness is overlooked. It's just like pushing for classes and stuff. So I think we talked about this um, during our training, like maybe the integration of something like a first year experience class for everyone, just so um, the importance of health and wellness for every major is emphasized. So just like Michaela said, um, just advocacy and pushing for um, more fo focus on that is really important. Great question. And thank you all for elaborating there. Uh, other questions or thoughts or comments from our audience here for this group? I have a question. Um, I don't know how you said that only certain majors have the first year experience course. Um, if it's not able to be put into all the curriculums of the different programs, do you think that it would be beneficial for during orientation or when students are first becoming acclimated to uni as first years or as transfer students that a session on health and wellness be built into that orientation time period? And if that would address some of the needs that students who don't get that first year experience may get. Yeah, I think that's um, a really important aspect. I know they do do, Erin um, Neptune actually does do a whole section during orientation on health and wellness. She does a waves of wellness activity that all the students fill out all of their aspects of health and what level they're at, how they're feeling. And she takes those um, and kind of evaluates them, sees where students are at. And I think if we were able to do more of a follow-up as students go through college um, to kind of continue to see where they're at, where they might need support in, in different areas, um, that that would be a great change and kind of an integration that we could have. Um, and it doesn't need to necessarily be into a class, but just having that as an option and making sure that that's more advertised, that students know that that's available for them. When we were looking at the survey results as well, a lot of people 
found, like uh, like we stated, mental health was such a huge issue in the counseling services at UNE. Um, so putting more emphasis on those, even just as a first year, second year, and as like obviously school gets more stressful as you um, are going up and uh, like applying to grad schools and stuff. So you could have like the um, go in and out mental health issues and having um, that support and like knowing where to find it, I think also was one of the bigger issues. People not really knowing who they can go to say they don't have, they don't need to go to like an actual counseling service, but Erin Neptune, who we did our peer health um, education program with, she like is really helpful with that. And not a lot of people know her name. So I think even just getting her name out into the community would help a lot. Thank you guys for answering that question um, and all of your questions. I think that was really helpful and I definitely agree. Um, I did the peer health education course in my undergrad um, like you guys did. And I'm happy to see it when I did, it was just whole us students. So I'm really happy to see that it's starting to branch out more and more students have access to it because we all will be healthcare professionals as well as like individuals. Um, and being you know, having those critical active listening skills is really important in all professions. So I'm really happy to see that it's expanding. Um, but that brings us to the end of our poster session. Thank you all for joining and presenting and for our faculty mentors who joined and participated, um, as well as people who were just viewing. Um, if you fill out our attendance, that would be lovely. I can drop it again in the chat, but that concludes our session. Is there anything you want to add, Colin? No, that was wonderful, Megan. Thank you all for being here. Definitely fill the attendance survey. That data is really helpful to us. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our amazing presenters for all your inspiring work this year. We are really proud of you all.